Hey everyone, welcome to Game Face, the flagship show of Sifted Games at Sifted.net. I'm Shane Satterfield, your humble host, who will be taking you through the biggest games, and there are lots of big games this week, and stories from the video game industry. Alongside me to do that is Matthew Kyle. What's up, Matt? How are you? I'm all right. A lot of stuff to play all of a sudden. Man, I, I, I've been saying this all month. I was like, the first of August is really slow, and then we're going to get slammed, mm-hmm. and that's exactly where we are right now. It will make for a great episode of the show that we have. I played three games this week that we're going to talk about. Matt, you played three games three. this week that we're going to talk mm-hmm. about. Um, and then there was a big Pokemon event we're going to discuss. Gamescom kind of started today. We're going to yeah. talk about... Yeah. Not, not <laughs> Did so you really? notice. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk about Gamescom. We're going to preview Gamescom a little bit for you guys to know what to expect from the show. Um, yeah. We got a big, big episode. Call of Duty was unveiled in full. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we got a great show for you guys. We don't want to spend a ton of time screwing around. Uh, before we get started, though, I do want to apologize. We tried, <laughs> Matt. It was a disaster. So we tried to do the Super Mario Maker 2, I play mm-hmm. everyone's level stream. I could not get the stream to work. Like, hmm. I, I did it from home because the internet connection there is better, and those streams are 1080p. Like, I think we stream 72060 yeah. for Game Face. Um, and those streams are 1080p, and I was like, I don't want to risk it. Um, so I'll do it from home. And for whatever reason, OBS and my PC have decided that they hate each other. Like, mm. I changed every setting I could. It didn't matter. Um, ultimately, what I found online is that I basically have to completely delete OBS from my PC and wipe it. Lose all my sessions, all my settings, and then reinstall it. Um, mm-hmm. That Other people have had the same problem as me, and that's the only way they've been able to fix it. Hmm. I don't know what's going on. As I've said, I need to upgrade my PC. It's just, like, impossible. You can't get the parts. parts. So I'm just kind of in this crappy situation. I do apologize. A lot of you guys showed up for that stream. Um, I was pleasantly surprised by how many of you guys showed up for that. Uh, I think it was going to be pretty awesome, but unfortunately, technical difficulties kept it from happening. Now, I'm not sure when we're going to do it. Um, Actually, Matt, let's just figure out next week's episode right here live on the show. Mm. Because I cannot do Tuesday of next week. I have a knee doctor appointment to set up my surgery for a little bit later in the year. Um, So I can't do Tuesday next week. Does Wednesday work for you? Uh, I think it will. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So there you go. Next week's game face is on Wednesday, not Tuesday. Mark that down in your calendar. And then I'm gone. I am taking my first vacation in I don't know how long it's been since I've taken a vacation, but it will be two years since I have gone home and saw my family. Two years. Um, So I'm going to be out from like September 3rd to the 13th, which is a Monday. Um, So we will miss one week of game face. Um, Am I going to be able to get a show together for the next morning? We'll see. I'm going to try. Um, But I will not have played a lot of stuff unless I play stuff after next week's show, and then I kind of hold that stuff for the next one. Anyway, um, it has to be done, people. For my sanity, I need to see my family. I have not seen my mom for two years. And as you guys know, my father is gone. So um, I'm going home, and it's going to be for about 13 days, 10 days. Yeah, it's like 13 days. Or no, 10 days. Um, but I need it. I need a little bit of a break. I hope you guys can understand. I hope people on Patreon understand. I hope our subscribers on Sifted can understand. Um, it's very easy to take it for granted if you live close to your family. Um, when you move out here, you kind of make a contract with yourself that like, yep, this is something I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to spend a lot of money and a lot of time just to go home to see people. With the pandemic, I haven't been able to do that. So that is happening. Um, I also wanted to do it before Q4 kicks in and all the games really start piling on. Um, So it's just kind of like perfect timing. I'm going to go home, spend some time with uh, the family for Labor Day. I hope you guys have a good Labor Day as well. Uh, Hopefully you're planning something fun if you can. It seems like it's like case by case around the world, whether you can actually get together with people. Mm -hmm. It does stink that I'm finally like getting ready to go home and we're having like this other wave Mm -hmm. right now. Um, But the area that she lives in, the numbers are like zero. Like, in her small town where she lives, I think they have two cases right now. Pennsylvania, in general, the cases are really low. Uh, So I feel pretty good about it. I think we, uh, and obviously I've been taking, I'm vaxxed, and, you know, 
I take precautions and I'm very cautious about things. So I think I should be good. And I think everybody should be good as long as you guys are good with me taking a little time off. That really is the thing that that sucks about the Patreon environment, in all honesty, mm-hmm. is that you it's hard to take time off because a lot of people aren't in tune with what you're doing. And like people on Sifted that are on Sifted.net, like they know what's going on. I'm always in the comments there. We're always chatting or whatever. Um, but like a lot of folks on our Patreon, like they just watch Game Face or they just watch Pactor Factor. And if content stops flowing through the Patreon, they're just like, WTF? Where's the content that I'm paying for? Um, so it's it's one part of this that I really dislike is mm-hmm. there's one there's no paid vacation. And when you take, do take vacation, people freak out. Yeah. And like Meanwhile, I've got one YouTuber that I support on Patreon who hasn't put out a video in like three months. Yeah. It's like, what, what's the difference here? Yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, that's the hard part. And then just... You know, being that I do almost everything myself on our Patreon, just always being on the squirrel wheel, never having somebody to, like, kick in and help other than Vincent, who is amazing and does kick in a lot and help. Um, But not having other people to, like, sit in and, like, do game face while I'm gone. Like, that would be nice if I could find somebody to host the show with you while I'm gone. But just not working out that way. So, people, I'm doing the best I can. You got to remember, I'm just one person. One person. So all the stuff that you're seeing happening, like that's all coming from me and Vincent in some cases. So um, hopefully you can give me a little bit of a break here. I can take some vacation and it won't hurt us financially and you guys won't be coming after me on Twitter. Uh, That would be awesome. I need it. Uh, All the health stuff I went through earlier in the year, like I just, I need to go home. So anyway, next week's show, Wednesday, and then we'll be off for a week. And then the following week, we'll maybe be on Tuesday. But just keep an eye on our on our Twitter feed. Uh, also, by the way, I've officially stopped retweeting stuff about Sifted from my personal account at Dinfire. Um, so if you've been following me there to get, like, all the updates, like when Pactor Factor is going up for free on YouTube or when Game Face is going up for free on YouTube, you need to follow S- at Sifted Games. Uh, and while you're at it, follow Matt Kyle as well. He's at M Kyle. Um, as I said, we have a huge, huge show today. Um, we just need, really need to get into it because there's a lot to get to. Um, we're going to kick things off first with Aliens Fireteam Elite. Um, it is a game. Game. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest releases of the week. I think it just came out today, actually. I think mm-hmm. it just released today. Uh, Matt and I have been playing it. We actually played it with a sifter the other night, Johnny Hurricane. Uh, it's a three-person squad-based team. All the B-roll you're going to see today of this game is Matt, myself, and Johnny Hurricane playing aliens. Um, it's it's a squad-based survival shooter, third-person shooter, mm-hmm. um, but it does only have three-person teams, so not four people like Left 4 Dead. Yeah, although Left 4 Dead with aliens is not wrong necessarily. That's true. Yeah, I mean, it is, but there are key differences in this. The biggest of which is, the, like, there are no safe houses. Yeah. Um, there's, like, checkpoints where you break the level up kind of thing. Yeah. There's no there's no point. I mean, it's sort of like places where it's like, okay, there's a bunch of resources here, and nothing will happen until you flip that switch. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. So it's mm-hmm. sort of safe houses, but, like, it's, um, it's, uh, it's aliens. <laughs> um. It's 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 it got repetitive fast. Yeah. Did you go back and play more after we played with Johnny? No. So I did. I did go play more. Um, it starts out really badly. Yeah. It's in a space station basically, and it's just one gray steel corridor. Yeah, I mean, it's very another. accurate to the property. It is. But like, yeah, it really is not a feast for the eyes early you, on. You do eventually. I'll just say this: a lot of the color palette is gray, brown, and red. Mm. Um, you do eventually get outside, and so there's more open areas and things like that. But it's still very drab, and I mean that's you're right. That's Aliens. It's it does fit the film. It is does feel a little bit oppressive as you keep playing the game. I felt that way anyway. Um, it's set 23 years after the film trilogy, but there's no story. No, <laughs> like there's like no plot at all. No, I mean there's stuff happening, but it's not. There's like an opening cinema yeah. that is just like, hey, like there's aliens. Yeah, there's aliens, and you're a new <laughs> new person, and you have to like fit in in this squad. But now you gotta go. Oh, you gotta go down and fight the things. Okay, and, you know, it's like the the Marines have been fighting these things for like two decades at this point. You know, like they're, yeah. they're, it's, they're not a surprise anymore. You know, they're yeah. just kind of a known threat that they go around fighting. 
another glorious day in the core, um, as they would say. Um, yeah, it's, if, if there's like a bigger... Can you think of the plot? Not really, no. I mean, <laughs> you're trying to rescue the, the guy off the ship for some That's the first reason. mission. You, you're going through the ship and rescuing like a scientist or yeah, whatever. And they slowly are becoming real. It's like, oh, what the... They were intentionally breeding these things. We're <laughs> yeah. like, really? Did you just get here? Yeah. Like, what do you... Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen the movies? Um, I mean, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's, it's look. It's not a bad game. No. Um, it's, it's not a good game either. No. I don't think. <laughs> um, you do so. You you also you do not play as like recognizable characters from the films. No, you, you create your own. You create your own character, and then you choose from five different classes. Um, I think Johnny had it right when he chose his class. He was a heavy, mm-hmm. and he had a flamethrower. And <laughs> flamethrower and a shoulder mounted rocket launcher. And, and he just wrecked shop <laughs> mission after mission. He was our clear guy. He was just clearing out rooms. That fire that uh flamethrower could just burn up like five or six of them at once mm-hmm. while we're all trying to shoot them with like shotguns and like automatic rifles mm-hmm. or whatever. I mean I was doing all right. I'll tell you this much headshots are pretty much impossible to miss in this game. Yeah, because uh, their heads are gigantic. Their heads are gigantic. <laughs> the auto aim is very, very generous. Not quite as generous as Back for Blood. Back for Blood had the most generous auto targeting mm-hmm. I've ever seen in a game. Um, this one's healthy, but it's not like snappy like Back for Blood was. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can just kind of point your gun in the general direction and just burst fire, and you get headshots pretty much. That's yeah. what I found playing. Yeah, and like hip fire. That was one of the things you you made me aware of like very early on. Was like you don't need to aim down sights. Yeah, hip, hip fire, fire works, works great. Yeah, it's very accurate, and which is good because, you, as you can see from this B-roll, you get swarmed by xenomorphs constantly. Um, as I said, it's three-player squads. You can play with bots. <laughs> I do not recommend it. So we were playing review code of this game, and it's ve- it was very hard to just mm-hmm. search for players and find players to play with. Um, so I was like, I have time now to play. I need to play this game. So I started playing with bots, and I did make it through the first mission with bots, the second mission, I think, was impossible with bots. They're really yeah, well, dumb. We kept hitting points where, like, you and, and uh, Johnny would be like, oh, like, this part's really hard. Like, and, like, we'd just burn through we'd it. We'd walk and, through it. And yeah. you're like, oh, that was, that was really different. easy with other people. <laughs> like, it, was... it makes a big – yeah, and I don't think that they scale the game well enough for maybe when you're playing with humans. Mm-hmm. But I would say that you can play with bots, but bots really aren't an option. It's going to be really, really hard to get through the game. Um, if you're playing with AI. And then the other problem is when you die, and I think you get, what, three downs before you're dead for good? I think so, yeah. I think or, maybe third, the, or maybe the third down The third is down is permanent, yeah. yeah. I think that's what it, how it works. Um, but if you're playing, if you are down three times and everybody else gets down three times, it ends and you get nothing and you go all the way back to the base. You have to start the whole mission over again. And you get none of the XP that you earned. Mm-hmm. And which, you waste any bonus cards you played. Yep. And that's another part of the game, kind of like the skulls in Halo. There are these, are they called challenge cards? Is that right? Challenge cards or bonus cards? I can't remember. Something like that. Yeah, challenge cards. And basically, you can just make the game harder, but it, then mm. it gives you bonuses. And we we had, didn't even have any cards. Johnny played one of his. I don't think we finished that mission that time. No, we fa- it was a three times experience thing, and we, we achieved the, the goal to give it to us, but we then we lost the mission. We ended up dying and didn't get anything. Yeah, and then the second one he played was less experience, but we had, we had to do a million damage, and we didn't even get close. Yeah, we didn't get anywhere near it. Um, not really boss fights in this. No, I mean, you, you run into bigger enemy, bigger aliens or, like, different types that, like, take more shots, and, like, they're kind of the hardest part of the swarms that happen. And they'll just jump um, out of holes in the wall out of nowhere. I assume they'll be, like, queens or something, stuff later in the game or whatever. Probably. Or um, but they just jump out of holes in the wall, mm-hmm. and they'll attack you. And for whatever reason, they really loved me. I seem to be the, always the person. They'll pin you down. And then there are you have to go through these quick time events to get them off of you, basically. But they'll come out of holes. They'll drop down from the ceiling out of nowhere. Like, in a lot of ways, there's, there's no way to avoid them. And then sometimes you'll try to shoot them, and they'll jump back in the hole. Mm-hmm. It's very frustrating. Um, and they are the toughest enemies in the game, generally. Um, there are four different campaigns. There are three chapters in each campaign. It probably took us, what, 40 minutes to get through each one, something like that, when you're playing with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you do the math there, you're looking at around six to eight hours of play if you're playing with decent players. Um, The unlocks, in addition to the fact that you lose all the XP, 
if you uh, if you don't complete the mission. Even when you do complete the mission, unlocks are really slow. Leveling up is really slow. Um, I've played a ton of this game, and I don't think I've ever still unlocked a new weapon entirely. Mm-hmm. I've unlocked like new scopes and things like that for them, but I've never unlocked an entirely new weapon, I don't think, to, that I remember anyway. Maybe one flash and I didn't see it. Um, so it's a grind. In, in all, if you're trying to unlock um, new stuff to use as you go forward, you got to grind along. Um, some people may not be too excited about that. I know I wasn't. Um, I also found it, Matt, maybe you had a better understanding of this than I did. I also had trouble like understanding how like the perks worked. It's this weird interface where you have these like diodes almost, oh, yeah, and you like pull them on this interface, and they yeah. have to like match the shapes or yeah, something. Yeah, there's like it's like Resident Evil's Resident Evil Four is like inventory. You have to like you stack it. You have to fit them in the space you have in available, the and as the, you level up more, you get more space in there. Yeah, to fit them. like. Certain perks are shaped this way, and another perk is shaped this way. So if you can't fit both of them in the same space, you can only pick one. Like, it's an interesting system. I don't know if I call it a good system. I hardly found anything, any perks that I could fit into my yeah, slot. Well, they're all very minor. It's like oh, plus twenty percent reload speed. None of it's particularly exciting. Yeah, it helps, but it's not like you're not looking at the perks you unlock uh, at least like in the first few levels and being like, oh, there's a game changer. It's like, yeah. It's, uh, I thought it was kind of boring. Yeah, I did too. Um, the general flow of the game or the loop of the game is you kind of fight through a bunch of corridors, fighting lots of the rank and file enemies, and mm-hmm. then you'll get to these points where you basically participate in a horde mode. Yeah. And it warns you, the game will say, hey, we're about to flood you with enemies. And so, yeah, it'll be like, pre- like the, the, the literal objective will turn to prepare for battle. Yeah, or something like, like there's that. a trigger point, and they make it very clear that, like, okay, once you activate this, here mm-hmm. comes the horde. Um, and I'm okay with that. I mean, that's just really the template for these types of games. Yeah. That's kind of how they work. Um, regardless of what your class is, like, there's one class that has turrets. But even if you don't play as that class... A lot of times when you get to one of those horde mode sections, there will be crates there that will give you mm-hmm. turrets. And you can buy turrets at the base, too. Yep. So, you know, if that's what you want. You but can, they're expensive. They're very expensive. Like, the, the, stuff is, the stuff at the base is ridiculously, ridiculously expensive. expensive. And they're one use. So if you buy a turret and you go into the map and use it, it's gone. Yeah. Whereas, like, if you save that money, you could have bought maybe a permanent upgrade for your weapons. Right. And so I will never, ever buy yeah. turrets from the store again. <laughs> it's like I'm good. Like... I got felt like I got burned because it cut, it took so much money. I didn't realize that it was just like this one use thing. Mm-hmm. I thought it would be a part of my class, like an ability, and then from that point yeah. on, I would be able to use turrets, and that's not how it's it works. A, it's a poorly conveyed interface in yep. a lot of ways. I think the whole interface is poorly conveyed. Mm-hmm. Um, as we were talking about the perks earlier, I think that system's goofy and weird. The other thing I think is weird is when you buy something from the store and equip it, it resets you back at the spawn point in the base. Really? I, whenever I bought something from like a vendor, a kiosk or whatever, like I didn't notice. I go in, I get it. You want to equip it and equip the thing, and then when I back out, I would be back by the drop ship, and I had to run off to wherever else I wanted to go. Huh? I, I didn't strange. notice that. That That's might have been a weird, weird. thing of mine. But <laughs> That's really freaking weird. Um, I never pull, came out of the store after buying something and was still in front of the store I bought it in. Yeah, that's pretty bizarre. Um, once you finish the campaign, there is a legitimate horde mode that unlocks that you can play. But you get so much of that through the campaign. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much draw there is after that to play it more. As we said, it's around six to eight hours long, depending on how good you are. Um, how did you feel about the combat? Other than we talked about kind of the aim assist already. Mm-hmm. How did you feel about the movement, how the guns felt, the cover system? Because it is cover based um, shooter, you can go behind yeah. cover in the game. Like the movement was more or less fine. The guns feel pretty anemic most of the time. I couldn't feel anything. Uh, part of the problem, I think, is um, you know they're using all the sound effects from the movies. Yeah, and those sound effects are cool. Like they're iconic sound effects, but they are not particularly forceful ones. Like no. the, the pulse rifle has a unique sound. But it sounds a little bit like steam escaping from a pipe. Yeah, it doesn't know? sound like it's pa- the yeah, other it weapons feel powerful. No, to me. they don't. And um, even the smart gun really mm-hmm. it still has that same kind of like brap a brap thing. But it yeah. doesn't feel like it's firing death out of it or anything. Um, the cover system, like you know, I discovered the cover system because there's a little thing that pops up. But like, I found it pretty much useless because the aliens can get around covered without yeah. any problem. Like, like you're not in a firefight with these things. You're you're 
fighting like swarming hordes. This is where playing about, further, they come out of a vent behind you at any given time, and all of a sudden you're you're stuck behind cover, and they're just whacking you from behind. You're like you know, you don't want to be stationary very long in this game. You can't in the first missions that we played together online. You can't really use a cover system. You're mm-hmm. absolutely right. Like there's no reason to hunker down behind anything. If you keep playing, the game eventually transforms into more like Gears of War. Mm-hmm. Like I where, figured there would be androids and stuff later yep, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, there are. And when you get to the, those parts sort of the like game. Sort of like Alien Isolation. Yeah. When you get to those parts of the game, you can predict where the enemies are coming from. And it does turn into more of a stop and pop experience where you're using mm-hmm. cover a lot. Uh, because you know which direction the enemies are coming from pretty much at all times. Yeah, whereas the whole... Kind of the whole point of the aliens is you don't know where they're coming right. from. Right, yeah. It is cool, though. Like, the radar that you have pulled straight out of the films. Yeah, the motion tracker does work pretty uh-huh. well. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's portrayed just like it yeah. is in the films as well, which I thought that was a nice touch. I do feel totally like... It's totally funny that's been 23 years and they don't have a better system than that. Yeah. That they rigged up with, like, <laughs> duct tape and, you know, like... But what are you going to do? I mean, I will say this. I feel like they did a pretty good job with the IP. Yeah, I mean, I don't. And I, again, that's something that I felt more strongly about the more I played it. Yeah, and like I, you know, I feel like it was a little, it wore out its welcome pretty fast. But like, that's not their fault. It's it's the IP is what it is. You know, I do wonder what else. The aliens were supposed to, you know, the aliens are interesting in the movie because they're just this unbeatable thing that comes at you and like mm-hmm. there you see them briefly and it's like, oh, what the hell is that? Um, as an as a video game enemy, they're sort of blah because like you can't portray them as they are in the movies or they'll be impossible to beat. Right. Um, I mean, already you, you've got to do something with the acidic blood and the way they do that here is like, it's, you know, it hurts you if you walk into the corpse of a thing that just died like three seconds ago, but after that it sort of disperses. Dissipates, yeah. Um, and it leaves like, you know, marks in the floor and stuff, which is nice, but like, it's you know, you, you can't really depict it if, you know, and there have been games where, like, you know, if you shot, if you headshot an alien too close to you in, like, the old AVP games, like, it would splatter on you and hurt you yep. and stuff. And, like, on one hand, that's accurate to the property. On the other hand, it's really annoying. You know, it's it's a hard thing to translate, really, uh, especially because uh, you're not supposed to stand a chance against these things. Right. Yeah. You know? Um, it's a little, it's a little backwards in that regard, but I understand. Cause not I only are you it. standing a chance, you're wiping out. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds also. and hundreds. <laughs> and I, I, I remember I said when I go near the end of the, the mission where you have to like kind of hold off yet another swarm of like a couple hundred of them. I'm like, so like, you know, we're on a space station or a ship or whatever. I'm like, every one of these things had to come out of a biological creature. How many right. people were on this ship? Yeah, where were the people? Like, how many where, people were on the ship? <laughs> Because you're right, they all have to nest inside yeah. an organism and then take it over and burst out. Like they find a bunch of hamsters somewhere? Or what? yeah. Like what's going on? I do feel like there's a lot of missed opportunities with this game to tell a story. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a reason that this IP came from film. Yeah. And there's a great opportunity to tell a great story here, and it just really just turns into like, we're going to yeah. send a ton of xenomorphs at you and try to kill them all. Yeah, I, I maintain that the, 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 the best and purest video game interpretation of this IP is Alien Isolation. I mean, let's be honest, there haven't been that many no. good interpretations of it, ever. No, it's, well, it's hard to do. Like, you know, like, same with Predator. Like, Predator feels like it should be more of a slam dunk, but the only Predator game I've really enjoyed is the Predator um, event they did in uh, Wildlands. Yeah. Um, which really did capture it that. It did, yeah. In part because they didn't have you play as the Predator. Right. You know, like, <laughs> and that was even in the old AVP games. It was like the most interesting campaign was always the Marine because playing as the Predator and the Alien sort of demystified them and didn't feel mm-hmm. very satisfying, but playing as the as the Marine at least sort of felt like you were in the movies. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, there's nothing here that I really felt was done wrong outside the UI was kind of clunky, but like there's just not much here. And like the fact that you're working your way towards shooting androids later is like, that's not an incentive to me. Like even in alien, alien isolation, I got tired of sneaking around the androids. Well, that's what the, the bots are androids, the, by the way, yeah, if the, you play by yourself. Oh, they're Joe's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I also don't really understand what it's called. Fire team elite. Nobody seems particularly elite. Yeah. I don't, game. I don't understand it either. Um, I did enjoy the game moderately. Like yeah, I don't hate it. No, no, definitely don't hate it. It's I mean, playing like, with you guys made it more fun. Yeah, it was. It was just sort of. It's like, oh uh, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah it's like, it does feel like a missed opportun- opportunity, though. Yeah, 
Someone's asking in chat, AJ, the legend, I believe, was asking, like, who would we like to see as far as a studio tackle this IP? Um, yeah, AJ, the legend, Watson, was asking. Uh, I mean, my answer to that is pretty much nobody. Like, I, I am firmly of the opinion that the Alien and Predator IPs should just go away. Like, they're done. We got a couple good movies. There's some good comics out there, a couple good games back in the day. You think the whole IP should go away? I don't see what else is left to do with Aliens. Wow. Interesting. As far as I'm concerned, there's two Alien movies. It's Alien yeah. and Aliens. The others were all garbage. I know you hated stripes. Prometheus. I kind of enjoyed um, it. I liked the... I would have liked Prometheus better if it was not related to Aliens. Yeah, but I can like, understand that. Um, also, I I have a... My, my Ridley Scott hot take is that Ridley Scott doesn't really understand the movies he makes. And the best movies he's made, he he just sort of got lucky. Oh, like I don't think he really understood why Blade Runner was good good the way it was, but he sort of figured it out visually, and it all kind of fell into place. Um, and then you get something like Prometheus, where he did. Fi- you, know, you think he figured Prometheus out visually, yeah, but none of the rest of it fell into place because it just wasn't on the page. Yeah. Um, and you had you know Blade Runner had the advantage of having actors like Harrison Ford and uh, Rutger Hauer sort of taking these characters and making them their own and making them make sense and adding their own spin and their own ideas to it. Mm-hmm. And that kind of came together in something amazing that's not going to happen when you're shooting everything in front of a green screen with motion capture on your face. Yep. So, I mean, I would like to see more I just don't stuff know what, from Aliens. I just don't know what's left. Yeah. Like, what else do you do? You know? Like, I mean, again, Prometheus was kind of different. It was an attempt at it, but then they went back to Alien Covenant, which they did, was just yeah. laughably bad. Yeah. And, and it was really bad. Um, I... I don't want to just completely write it off, Matt. I feel like there's an opportunity to do stuff with it, but you're right. Like the last decade of stuff around it mm-hmm. doesn't engender a lot of uh, <laughs> no. a lot of hope. This is one of the few times when I I will go to, with the like just make something new. Yeah, vibe. You know, like I you know, like I said, I'm a big fan of iteration. Like just do do it well instead of doing something yep. new. You say it all the time, but like you got to know when you're beat. <laughs> yeah. sometimes and I feel like the alien IP has sort of beaten a lot of people and I'd be down for like an isolation too I feel like a refinement of that game would probably have something to say and something to do with it that would be uh, a cool evolution of what they'd already done which I mean I, alien isolation is a great game um, it's too long but uh, they really nailed it you know in terms of capturing that first movie with the single super dangerous alien mm-hmm. um, the aliens thing is harder to do because Partly because like it's funny to show people who are younger now aliens because they come if they've never seen it before they tend to come away from aliens feeling like they just saw the most cliched movie they've ever seen and the thing that you have to explain is like yeah all those cliches come from this movie like the reason you think you've seen it before is because this movie changed action films it did like yeah like like all the 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 over the top like you know like marine dialogue and like the tough as nails guy like all that that was all alien aliens yeah. put that into the popular mainstream that's what all R rated action films had to be from then on uh, people do not maybe who weren't there at the th- maybe do not understand just how influential James Cameron was yeah. for that fifteen year stretch of time I mean, they just every, don't want to give him credit cause. maybe where every movie he made was basically a shift in the zeitgeist Terminator. Yeah. Aliens, Terminator Two. Yeah. Um, People like to hate on him, but man. Yeah. I mean, look, look what happened. I mean, look. I don't like Avatar, but mm-hmm. like you can't deny its success. Yeah. Same with Titanic. You know, like, Avatar Two is coming, and I'm like, will you I'd, guys see it? Probably, but like, I don't. Yeah. I don't have any interest really in in Avatar. I don't know anyone who cares about Avatar. But am I dumb enough to bet against James Cameron? No, of course yeah, not. That's a fool's errand. Like, do I think Avatar Two is gonna like? beat Endgame and and Avatar now that they re-released it to regain that that title. Mm, 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 mm. Um, Did they really do that? They re-released Avatar briefly so it's number one again. No way. Yep. Petty, petty, petty ass shit. I didn't know Um, that. Yeah. Wow. Um, James, Jim Jim wanted that uh, that title back. What an ego he has. But, um, and now Avatar 2. I mean, I'm not going to bet against it being the number one movie of all time all of a sudden, but who knows? I don't, I I doubt it. I find it it hard to believe. But I think it'll do well. Um, It will, yeah. But but. I guess Alien, uh, but It had the 3D thing going for it. Yeah, 3D. I mean, Alien, Avatar was a theme park ride, not a a film. Yeah. And I don't think you have that zeitgeist. People, Convergence I mean, on all, Avatar 2. It's big hook, 
people don't care about anymore. Right. Do, are there even 3D theaters left at this point? There are, but the screenings are few and far between yeah. those places. Even the Chinese theater doesn't Yeah, I hardly that. ever see, like, yeah. the ability to buy tickets for it's 3D. Rare. Yeah. Because it doesn't do any good. And also now, in the, even now in the in the pandemic era, nobody wants to share glasses. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's a good point. Is um, there any hook to the new Avatar? I mean, it's going to be underwater, mostly. Oh, really? So if you like the abyss. <laughs> or water world. Water world, yeah. <laughs> But that's what I, as I understand, there's a lot of water stuff. They have to go okay. under the ocean to find a thing or whatever. Interesting. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I have not given up on aliens. Yeah. I, but I'll say this. For instance, for example, this game was published by Focus Home Interactive, mm-hmm. which I'll say this. They're a rising force in gaming. They're kind of like in the double A tier now. They're not, I don't consider them like an indie publisher anymore. Like, I consider them a double A publisher for the most part. They've released some pretty good stuff over the last handful of years. Um, but I think it shows you that if Focus is able to get that IP now, mm-hmm. Sega had it before, it's, I think, basically the gaming mm-hmm. industry is kind of agreeing with you. Yeah. That uh, it's an IP that's on a downward Sneaky Charlotte Snake says they get, in Ireland, they get sealed plastic 3D glasses and keep them. You don't share glasses. Oh. Uh, well, if that's I a, remember. That's a good strategy. It, they always made you throw them in the barrel here. Yeah, here but you were have, they you just have, recycling them yeah, and taking they them back out? they recycle them, yeah. They, I mean, they clean them usually, like, spray them down with something. Nobody's going to trust people uh, to do that now. No. And also, I do, you know, so someone's defending the abyss. I like the abyss, I, especially the director's cut. I think is better. Um, uh, but most people do not like the abyss. Uh, yeah. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, like, abyss fans are not something to build a blockbuster on the back of. Uh, as much as I, I, I like every, I like every movie Cameron made until Avatar. I don't love True Lies, but the other thing you got to remember. James Cameron has made seven movies. Is that it? He's only made seven movies. Like wow. that's not including Piranha Two, which he has a director's credit on that he says he barely got to touch. Like, he's he, batting like a thousand. But like he's made seven. If you find me someone else who's made seven films who has influenced the world of cinema that much, like that—that that is an amazing. That's career. amazing. Yeah. Um, Vincent is was saying that uh, the game was originally supposed to be published by Fox. Right. And ended up with right. Focus. That so, makes sense. So it was shuffled around even. So to your point, I think, you know, you're probably right. The IP Mm -hmm. has lost a good bit of its luster. I still think there's something there that they can do with it. But as you I just wonder if it's relevant now with like millennials and what's what's younger than millennials? Generation Z. Z? Yeah, I don't know. Like I mean I think I think Alien and Aliens will always be good movies to whoever, um, for the most part. But like once you get past that, you're in a you're in a weird you know, as once again, James Cameron probably said it best at the end of the Aliens DVD commentary because it was on the, tr- the quadrilogy box set. So they were introducing the next film kind of as they were ending the, the new film. So like Ridley Scott was like, and next up we're going to see James Cameron's amazing you know, evolution of what we did here. Yeah. And at the end of Aliens, James Cameron says, okay, next up is coming Alien 3. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, it's not how I would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's... And that kind of sums up the Alien IP since about 1986. It's like, yeah. nah, that's not how I would have done it. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Uh, so anyway, there you go. That's Aliens Fireteam Elite. It's available for PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Uh, we never even said, do we recommend if people pick it up? I not do for not. full price. I don't either. No. Like, like I, 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 I'm sure this will be cheap as hell in about eight months. And I don't even know if you have to wait that long. Maybe not even that long. Because you got to remember, Back for Blood is coming here pretty right. soon. Right and. You know, in Black, I would imagine you're going to be some be some pretty deep Black Friday discounts on this thing. Yeah, I would recommend Back for having played a lot of Back for Blood in beta. I would recommend Back for Blood over Aliens Fireteam mm-hmm. Elite, absolutely. And I wasn't a huge fan of Back for Blood either, um, but having the extra person in the squad, it's there's more variety in Back mm-hmm. for Blood because there's like boss fights and things like yeah. that. I mean, uh, it is only forty bucks, but like still. still. Yeah, I'd pin, I'd spend like twenty twenty five yeah. for it. I mean, the yeah. other part too is it's not that long. No, no, it's it's. I was surprised to hear how short it was. Yeah. So there you go. This aliens fire team. Then again, I don't want to play that for twelve hours. So. Yeah, I think <laughs> like, that six to eight is right around the sweet spot for that game. I'm sure to have DLC, I'm guessing eventually. Yeah, I'm sure. I would think so. Um, all right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about a game that is hard to discuss. I think it is. Um, it's a game called 12 Minutes, and the reason it's hard to discuss is because you have to do a lot of dancing around it to not spoil things. It's a point-and-click adventure mm-hmm. game that basically takes place in a one-bedroom apartment. The whole thing. Mm-hmm. With, like, 
a living room slash kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom. And that's pretty much where the whole game takes place. Mm-hmm. Um, it is basically centered on a husband and wife. Um, the whole thing starts, the loop starts, and this, this is one thing to keep in mind. It's like Groundhog Day. You play through the same 12 minutes of the same day over and over again. And it always starts with the husband coming in the door. Um, and so you come into the door, the wife walks out of the bathroom. Um, she says, I'm going to make, I'm making dessert. I have big news. And from there, that's where you start making your choices and decisions that will affect what actually mm-hmm. happens inside that apartment. Um, again, it's hard to discuss and figure out what we can and can't say without spoiling the game. Um, I think we can talk about the cop. Yeah. So eventually, let me just get the You can talk about Willem Dafoe. Yeah. If that Spider-Man trailer can talk about Willem Dafoe, we can talk about Willem Dafoe in this. <laughs> How dare you blow that reveal, Sony? <laughs> That trailer was, I mean, I'm excited about that Spider-Man movie, but that trailer was some of the most artless garbage I have ever seen. Like, that People was just. People were waiting, like. Oh, yeah. But that was, that, again, I mean, it's just Sony to Pictures marketing. It's just what they do. It's like coming to the theaters, the following plot. But that was a three-minute synopsis of the first half of that movie. Yeah. That was all that was. I'm like, I know the ha- first half of the film now. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Like, <laughs> like, I didn't even want to link that to my friends who were interested because I felt it was too spoilery. I didn't watch it. It was ridiculous. I saw the comments and from it, people and saying it, it was spoilery. And at the end, it, I mean, I, I, I don't care about spoilers. I don't, I go into no, things knowing tons of stuff. I don't, you know, I'm, I don't avoid them. You can still enjoy but, it. But, yeah. I, but I look at this, I'm just like, why? Why'd you tell people this stuff? Like, there's all these good surprises and you just blow it. It's yeah. so, and they do that every time. They've done that since Men in Black. Like, going back to the 90s, Sony Pictures has always done trailers like that, and I don't get it. I don't Meanwhile, get it Shang-Chi, like, you don't know anything about that movie. Like, you think you do. You think you got a handle on what Shang-Chi is from those trailers. You do not. Yeah. Like, Marvel's and Disney's trailer people are amazing. Yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> like, yeah, I really, yeah, Willem Dafoe set me off there. Um, <laughs> is that what set it off, Willem Dafoe? Because you mentioned Willem Dafoe. What can we mention the Willem Dafoe character? I'm like, if, if we can mention the fucking Green Goblin's back, we can talk about how... <laughs> <laughs> William, Def- William Defoe shows up six minutes into this game. <laughs> yep. So uh, let's see. Where do we leave off there? Talking about 12 minutes. Um, so anyway, a, a cop or someone knocks at the door. He says, basically, you both are under arrest. Um, the husband, who you generally play as, has no clue what's going on. Um, the wife acts like she has no clue what's going on. Mm-hmm. It turns out she does have a clue of what's going on. Um, except she doesn't. Except it's she like, it's a lot doesn't. Of, it's a lot really. of whirls and twists and weird things. Yeah. Um, and as basically the, the 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 gist of what you need to do is take information you learn in one loop and apply it to the next one. Usually it'll unlock new dialogue options or something. It's part of the challenge is figuring out how to get to those. Yeah. Or what you can use to trigger those. Uh, one of my problems with this game is similar to, to some of the problems I had with uh, Ace Attorney, except more so. There are a, there's a few things, specifically two things in this game that you cannot do until the character knows about it. Mm-hmm. And if even if you know it, there's no way to stumble onto it. You have to go through a very specific, like, order of events to make it happen, and I think that's annoying. But eventually and they streamline it. It does get, but like one of the things I'm thinking of is one of the last things you have to do, oh. where you literally have to repeat a loop to do one change, and if you don't time it right, you have to do the loop again. That's like and the second to last loop in the yes. game. Yeah, I know what you're talking. And about. like, no, yeah. like that, like that was really annoying. To I mean, me. I think we can explain one of the problems, which mm-hmm. is as you play it over and over again, you start to learn information, but you retain the information as the husband. The wife does not. So mm-hmm. the, the problem becomes that every time it starts over, you have to figure out a way to speak to the wife to fill her mm-hmm. in on what you've already figured out and, and have her believe it. Right. And every time you come up with a new idea, you have to do that all over again. Like yeah. it, it, There's a lot of repeating like the same conversation with her to get back to the starting point of, okay, she believes you that you're in a time loop. You've got established the information that you have, and she knows what you're talking about. Now I can try this thing that I think might work. And if it doesn't work, you got to do it all you again. You do it all over again. And then you have to reestablish with her right. again that I'm living in a time loop. Mm-hmm. And, this and yes, is... that does get streamlined eventually. But there's a yeah. middle part of the game where you're just like, oh, my God. And it's the same. Well, it should, well the, the fact that they streamline it later, yeah. they should have streamlined it earlier. Earlier, yeah. Just streamline it differently. It's like, when do they decide, okay, now you can just ask her two questions yeah. and she'll believe you. And sometimes you can skip dialogue and sometimes you can't. Yeah. Um, it's. Uh, I mean, I got stuck at some points. Like... 
some of the stuff that you're supposed to do doesn't make logical sense to me. Like, no. I, there's a couple things where I just ended up figuring it out because it was, like, the only object left that I hadn't interacted with. Mm-hmm. Um, not because it made sense logically, but, like, finally I'd fiddle with something, and I'd be like, oh, okay, I can see now. Like, there's a cell phone that you find in the closet. And, like, I didn't even know for the longest time I could go into the closet. Mm. Like, I thought you could open it. Like, I opened it the first time I went into the apartment. It didn't look like you could walk in there. Mm. But as it I, turns I mean, out, you can. I mean, I did that pretty early on. Like, the, the, the thing I had to learn was, like, the timing of what you can do when you can do it. Yeah. Like, there's some elements of that that I yep. thought were going to be on it. Because there's a thing where, like, you know, if you go just about anywhere in the apartment when you first get there, like, when you when you arrive, she's in the bathroom, and she comes out of the bathroom and comes up and kisses you hello back mm-hmm. from work and everything. And that's how it always um, starts. It always starts. Uh, and she'll find you no matter where you are in the apartment. Right. Unless yeah. you go in that closet. Right. Which I didn't realize that the closet was like the one place the AI wouldn't automatically, you know, beeline to me. Right, right. And so it it didn't even occur to me to try that because she found me no matter. I could go in the bedroom, close the door, sit down in the dark in the easy chair, and she'd come right over. She knew exactly where you were. Yeah. Yeah. It was was like, okay. Like, um, yeah, it's it's, uh, now here's one thing I like about it. But but I will say that as, as unintuitive as some of the puzzles are, it's not even in the top. 50 of some of the more obtuse point and click adventure game puzzle things I've had to deal with in, yeah. my, in my whole lifetime playing. And these generally, games. those games I would have to cheat to get through them. Um, yeah, these are these are way more like I managed to get way more logical this. than like a, a Gabriel Knight or, yeah. or a King's Quest. Like I, d- I managed to get through this game without any help. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were times where I was right on the edge, like with the phone. Like I was like, "What mm-hmm. in the heck am I supposed to do?" I'm like, I looked at everything. I've tried everything. I've examined every object. Oh my gosh, there's a cell phone in the closet. Why mm-hmm. is there a cell phone in the closet? But what I like about this game, Matt, is you can fiddle around with stuff and there's payoffs. So, um, again, it's hard to talk about this stuff without spoiling it. Um, so there's certain objects you can find in the world. One of them is you can find sleeping pills in the bathroom. There's mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff that you can do with the sleeping pills. Um, once you start to memorize your wife's patterns and what she does every time, like you can slip her the sleeping pills and I'm not going to say what it does because it kind of spoils stuff. Like immediately you can slip her the sleeping pills. Like as soon as you get in there, like almost, then you can eat both desserts. Right. Exactly (laughs) though. But like almost like before she even comes out Mm -hmm. to kiss you, you can get the pills into her cup so that she sits down and then she goes up to Mm -hmm. fill up her cup with water and there's sleeping pills in the water. And then she drinks the water and I'm not going to spoil what happens. But I also enjoyed that. um, If you set the table with the desserts and then the cop shows up because the cop wants to go after her first. Right. And you can like interrupt him and whatever. But you can just, while he, like, handcuffs her and throws her to the ground of the apartment, you can just sit at the table and eat your dessert. Oh, really? <laughs> while that's all happening. <laughs> I thought that was very funny. Like, for instance, I, <laughs> for when I played this game, like, I didn't even eat dessert for the mm-hmm. first, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 loops I went through. I didn't even eat dessert. Because once I started figuring out, like, the sleeping pill stuff, I was like, oh, this has got to be, like, the key to, like, and it turns out, like, it wasn't. Right. But it sent me off on this tangent where I just started experimenting with the sleeping pills to see what I could do with them. Yeah, I went for the expected route as soon as I, because, like, you know, it's a time loop game. You got to know what the loop is first. Yeah. You got to know what the baseline is. I just started fiddling, like, right um, away. It took a while. Like, I was playing with my friend, and, and we couldn't figure uh, the first step out of the, like, we couldn't figure out what the first step was. We were also confused by the phone and, like, mm-hmm. what to do with the sleeping pills. And I'm like, do we need to get the cop to have a drink or something? Mm-hmm. Like, what are we doing? Um, you know, her first instinct was to try to stab him with the kitchen knife. <laughs> and I was like, that's good. Yeah, sure. All right. Why not? I um, mean, that makes sense. Yeah. I didn't try it, but it makes sense. Uh, and like, uh, so I had to look up. I, I finally looked up kind of like, what's the first step out of this? And I'm like the rest of We expected the rest of it kind of fall into place. And it more or less does. Mm-hmm. But like, uh, I accidentally did see part of the, like a little snippet of like what the big twist is. And uh-huh. I was like, what? <laughs> like, like you will never guess where this goes. You won't. I'll tell you that much. You won't. Um, that, I mean, that's that's, that's not a, an endorsement, by the way. But I think for <laughs> most like, people, that's a positive, though. Yeah, I mean, to yeah, hear it in the context of you'll us never figure it. out where it ends from where it begins, which never. is at least. Uh, oh, the ending is shocking. Yeah, you'll be surprised. To, not spoiling anything, the ending of the game is shocking. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a blanket term that you can use that's accurate. Yeah, I think so. Um, I would append shockingly dumb 
to that, but like that, your mileage will vary. On I that, also I think. think that some people might be offended by it a little bit. Oh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a, it goes a place. It it definitely does go a place. It's one of those <laughs> things. It has a revelation. Choices are made. Yes, and choices have consequences. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those games where you have. There's a revelation in it, and it just sends your mind going like dominoes. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, so, oh, oh, so, oh, oh, so, oh, my gosh. Like, yeah, it has a really good twist. Um, that no, Well, I guess good is a relative yeah, term. Yeah, I wouldn't. I mean. An unexpected twist. Unexpected twist, twist yes. Good? Yeah. Mm. Your mileage will vary on that one. Um, but I, I'll like say. Like, my reaction was just like, what? <laughs> like, come on. Like, <laughs> What is like, this? It seems like there's a bunch of different endings. Yeah, there's a few different endings. Yeah, I got what I think is the, um, like the 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 best the canon the ending, re- the continue ending. I think mm-hmm. it's called. Um, I don't know why it's called that actually, because the game does go back to the title screen after that. But like, well, I finished the game and it just threw me right back into the room again. Yeah, it, it threw me back to the game. I got credits and I went to the title screen, and if I hit continue i would start the game over again oh from the beginning yeah see i didn't as far as i could tell from that there was like i didn't have any the other information again it just sort of started over there were a couple of differences like there there are things in the apartment that change with each time loop and don't reset with the loop and finding those you don't need any of that stuff to like get through the game but there's like achievements for like looking at the things that change every time they change mm-hmm. and stuff like that, which I didn't realize until pretty much the very end of the game that was happening. Yeah, um, I would say overall I enjoyed Twelve Minutes. Uh, I enjoyed it's, it until the I, end. The end was. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna have to give this the uh, M Night Shyamalan Signs Award for like, <laughs> wow, it was ninety for five percent great, and the last five minutes made me say, Ruined no, I'm never everything. touching you again, kind of thing. Um, it's uh, I it's, I like the idea yeah. of it. It's a it's a really cool idea, and it's exec- it's executed well. I mean, they they did it. They pulled it off for the most part. Yeah. There's a couple of those moments where like it's making you play the way it wants you to play to get the information like, unlocked. But like, other than a couple of those times, I did feel like I was free to kind of mess around and do that. You know, I wish there was a better way to like get back to the point. Because you know, like I you know this is actually what annoyed me about Majora's Mask was like when by the time I'd figure out what I wanted to do or had to do. It was usually too late in the loop to yep. get it done before you have it would to do finish. The loop again. And one time I did have that with this, like, where I could finish. Figured it out just late enough that I wasn't able to finish the conversation I was having that was going to get me that extra information. So I had to do the exact same loop all over again, but this time doing it faster because it didn't take me the first three minutes to figure out what to do. Yeah. And I find that really tedious. AJ the Lender Legend Watson is asking, how is the writing? I think it's pretty good. It's fine, you know, and they got you know they got top level talent. They got James McAvoy, Daisy Ridley, and Willem Dafoe. Yeah, here. the voice talent's really um, good. It was a little weird at first that McAvoy and Ridley are doing American accents. Yeah, uh, Ridley is not the best American accent in the world, but um, <laughs> she even has her own dialect coach at the in the credits. If oh, you really? Uh, so they worked on it. They did. Uh-huh. They did try. Uh, the, and I was like, why are they? Why not just have them just- be? And, and the reason is be- the reason is because one of the plot points requires the American medical system to be a factor. No, that's right. That's true. Yeah, I didn't think it's about It's like the that. Breaking Bad thing where it's like if that took place <laughs> in almost any other country, there'd be no story. Because he'd just go get treatment for his lung cancer and that would be the end of the, right. end of the show. Right, yeah, but because of the but American because he lives healthcare in America. system, he has to sell ice <laughs> to survive. <laughs> that's crazy to think about. Um, I think the writing's pretty good. I do think that the uh, top-down perspective is, I think it's a easy way out. I think a little bit. That, I think that they um, did it so they wouldn't have to animate people's faces while they talk. I and, think there's some of that, but it's also sort of, it also sort of works thematically in the sense that you are sort of playing with dolls. Yeah. Like you you're, feel you're a manipulating like a these people yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I, I, I get why you chose that. Yeah. Um, but it does give them a shortcut to make these characters a little less. Well, it's a narrative-driven human. game, and you can't see their you faces. You can't see their face. Yeah, it's it's a little weird that way. So there was always, there's always that barrier between you yeah. and them. Um, and I wonder kind of what that's the kind of the thing with the twist and sort of like the, like the my my thing with it is I came up like what okay what what did you want me to get out of this? Yeah. Like I don't know I don't know what they're trying to say in the end. I think they just want you to be entertained. Yeah, I think that this was like oh you'll never see what's going to happen here like. But usually, like a story has some kind of thing it wants to communicate, and right. like I'm not sure what I what the what the message was. Here. Uh, if there is a message in this game, I don't, I'm not sure that I want to know what it is. Maybe not, because based upon the how the thing ends, I'm sure people li- are listening to this right now, and they're like, "Oh wow, like I need to play this game." Mm-hmm. But 
I mean, I would argue that, you know, especially if you have Game Pass, you should. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, it's like worth the download. People are going to talk, you know, love it or hate it or anything in between. People are going to talk about this game for the rest of the year. Yeah. It's going to be, in, it's going it. to at least be in the, in the most innovative categories in the Game of the Year uh, contest. Like, it's, it's. I mean, I finished it too, and I was like, is this going to be like, best adventure game is it going to be i mean not cons- for me but is it like, going to be in consideration for like best story i think it will be i think i think it'll show up at the game you know the game developers choice awards next year is yeah. like you know, for, for design and stuff like, yeah you know th- there's a there's a thing here there's a you know this kind of goes back to i think it was warren specter who used to say like he was the, the game he really wanted to make was a game that just takes place in one city block yeah and well, nothing, here it is in war- <laughs> and here yeah you shrink this down to be even less ambitious because one know, new york city apartment because warren's talking about like a triple a big production yeah. and this is like a small indie thing yeah but i think for the most part you know i don't like i'm not thrilled with where the the story ends up going um and I, I don't think it really ever figures out what it wants to say but in terms of kind of what it what it is the game itself the you know, executing the concept as an art object sort of yeah. thing i think they nailed it it's clever yeah it's yeah. clever and they did what they said they were going to do yeah um, which is increasingly rare. It like, is. let's be honest. You know, like this, yep. like this is the thing where you know we heard about this game a long time ago. It's called Twelve Minutes. They said this is what it's going to be, and this we're going to do, and like it delivered on that. Yeah, yeah. It did not cut corners. They did not like revamp. It's like, oh, we couldn't get it to work, so instead, it's just like you're just going to play this three times, and it's going to be. This. It's not that. You, know, no, you, no. you really are doing what they said. Again, they I was did. pleasantly surprised how I could fiddle around with stuff. Yeah. in the world, and there was a payoff for it. Like there were cinematics mm-hmm. showing what would happen if you did this. It yeah. wasn't just like the yeah, loop it was, ends. It was a thing about. It was that thing of like. It's not just that they let you play around. It's that they clearly thought about what you could what do. What you could possibly and what I would think mess around do. with and what yeah. And, yeah. They, and they gave you payoffs for those yep. things, yeah. even if they were not useful to advancing the game. Yep, for sure. And that's, that's always fun. Yeah, I mean, overall, I enjoyed the game. Um, if somebody. How much would you tell someone to pay for this game? Because obviously a lot of people are going to get it on Game Pass, but some people maybe won't. It may be. I wonder if this will be ported to other platforms later, because right now it's just PC and Xbox. Mm-hmm. I imagine it'll be on everything at some point. Um, so eventually some perfect people... Perfect for the Switch! <laughs> um, so eventually people are going to have to figure out whether they want to buy this or not. Yeah. Um, what would you recommend someone pay for this game? Like, I wouldn't be upset if I'd paid 20 bucks for it. That's it's, it's steep, but, like, it was unique... Um, and if I didn't think the end of the story was stupid, like I would be more happy about twenty bucks. I would sell it for twelve dollars. Oh, that would be a nice. It's a good tie-in. <laughs> yeah, it's to me that's the perfect price. It'll make people remember. Twelve dollars for twelve minutes. I mean, I didn't cheat to play like an old nine hundred number to play through it, and I think it probably took me three hours maybe to get through it. It seemed like ultimately there were only like ten loops or something. Roughly. I think it was like yeah, about about ten or eleven. Yeah, if you do it all right. Yeah. Like, if you could, you could probably speed run this. I mean, thing. I went through way more loops than that. Oh, yeah. I'm it just took, saying, like, it took me closer to If four you were hours, to be- mainline, if you knew what you were doing, I think there were, like, literally, like, maybe 10 different ones. Yeah, you if, you main, if you buzz through this with knowing everything, I think it'd probably take you two hours. And that's purely because it takes some time for the conversations to play out. Yeah. Yeah. And you can fast forward those. You can fast forward some of them, not all of them. We have to listen the first time, I believe. And no, you have, to, you have to look like the, when there's certain things, it's mainly when, you, when the guy is not involved. Uh, your character, if other characters are talking, you can't fast forward that. Oh. So I had to sit through a bunch of conversations between the cop and the wife. I did have until I figured out what I had to do. Of triumph at times playing this because I would see a situation I'm like, how in the heck am I going to get them out of this? Mm-hmm. And then I'd figure it out. I'd be like, oh, wow. Like I actually accomplished something I didn't think I was going to accomplish. Yeah, it's an interesting little puzzle box yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And like once you f- and there is an element of like sometimes it's like you figure out what what you needed to do and you're like oh okay mm-hmm. so, and sometimes you figure out, and it's like that's ridiculous like, yeah. and a couple of times the game got in its own way in that regard but for the most part I think it played pretty fair yeah um, I did enjoy it at times it got a little annoying at times as Matt said there are some things you have to do that like the only way I figured them out was just trial and error yeah like there was no logic that led me to it where I'm like hey if I could find this then I could do this or that it's like oh I found this object. Now I'm fiddling around with it. Oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. And there's a good bit of that in this game. Um, But I do think it'll be up for discussion for Adventure Game of the Year, Best Story at the End of the Year. I mean, Um, it's definitely going to be... Whether it deserves it or not, I don't know. I think it's going to be a little bit of a, you know, ooh, it's the indie innovative darling kind of thing, you know, Mm -hmm. whether it it deserves it or not. Let's start a a new trend of Groundhog Day games. No. (laughs) 
Because I think this is really hard, hard to make. They are hard to make. Like, yeah. This is this is not a game that I would want to attempt to clone. Like I'm sure the the developer there was a whiteboard somewhere oh, that yeah. just had like these branching paths that go off mm-hmm. in all these different directions. It's annoying to have to make a game that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't honestly. I wouldn't spend more than fifteen on this. I think twelve is perfect. Um, but yeah. And it is on Game Pass, so if you're a subscriber, you can just download it and play it for free. And we both, I think, wholeheartedly recommend to at least give it a try. And I would say try to stick with it for at least, like, 45 minutes. Because I think at first it can be very intimidating. You're like, wait a minute. Like, it took me a a while for, for me to wrap my mind around what I needed to do in the game world with the loops. Mm-hmm. And once I figured that out and had kind of that foundation to work from, that's when I started sorting out, like, how to actually make progress through the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't like and pay attention to those paintings in the hallway. And the yeah, they start. matter. They ma- those things matter. Yeah, you won't know why they matter till much later, but they do matter. Yeah. One other tip: don't answer the door until the doorbell rings. Yes, and that will pay dividends later on in the yes. game. I promise you. So there you go. That's twelve patience, minutes. patience, grasshopper. Yeah. <laughs> That's twelve minutes available for PC and Xbox, both one and series, and it's on Game Pass right now. You can download it for free if you're a subscriber. Like, I'm guessing probably 70% of the people who watch Game Face are at this point. Mm. Maybe 50. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, you have to run a poll? I'm just saying, yeah, actually, that's not a bad poll. I'm just guessing based upon the conversation on the site, knowing what percentage of the people on the site are Xbox or PC players. Um, I mean, if you're an Xbox or PC player and you don't have Game Pass yet, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? Um, Psychonauts 2 goes up today on game pass day and date it's gonna be there which wow that game has got some big reviews yeah that's the game i ran out of time to play for this week's episode unfortunately. if my uh fantasy team wasn't already crashing and burning it would be a good uh, good entry yeah um but we'll talk about it in next week's show i just ran out of time i played three games this week well, and it only I, came out today and it so. did come out today um but we're gonna be a week late on that um and i do get code for xbox mm-hmm. stuff i could have but I had three other games I was playing. I just ran out of time, unfortunately. Um, but the reviews for it, wow. Really high. I'm kind of surprised by those. Are you? Nope. Really? That's why I picked it. I thought that's what was going to happen. Man. I hope they're right. Mm-hmm. That's all I can say. Um, as soon as I get out of here today, my ass is going straight to Psychonauts 2. <laughs> I hope these reviews are right. Um, I'll say this. I would be surprised if they are. I don't know. Um, I love the first Psychonauts, but... It's you know what Matt I'm realizing is some three of like the biggest games from this year are like platformers. Mm-hmm. You got Ratchet, now Psychonauts too. It's like in Game of the Year consideration. Mm-hmm. Like it's totally gonna be. Um, which how long has it been since like a platform game? Two like platforming games were the prevalent genre in yeah. the Game of the Year race. I can't remember, dude. Like 1996. 90s, yeah. <laughs> That's really bizarre. Banjo era. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, So anyway, it's time to move on. We're going to talk next about Pokemon Presents. It was a half-hour-long presentation from Nintendo this week. It blew out everything Pokemon. Um, We're not going to talk about all of it. Uh, Like, there's stuff coming to, like, Pokemon Unite and Pokemon Go and this other Pokemon game. I don't even know what the hell it is. But for our purposes, uh, and the bulk of the presentation focused on two games that most of our audience cares about. Um, it is the remake of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, and shockingly, um, a huge presentation on Pokemon Legends. And you were right; it is Arceus. Mm-hmm. Um, they literally put out like eleven minutes of new gameplay from Arceus. Did you get to watch it? Nope. Okay, um, we're going to talk about Diamond and Pearl first, um, and it's called uh, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining mm-hmm. Pearl. Which I think is a little goofy. It's a little much. A little uh, much, maybe, but... They always have weird, you know, like, I mean, is, it, is that better or worse than Alpha, Omega, Alpha and Omega, <laughs> st- Sapphire and Ruby, whatever those were? I mean, you're right. Let's just be honest. It, it, their naming conventions are a little goofy. Um, I'm but, waiting for Gleaming Sword and Sturdy Shield. Yeah. Or something. yeah, yeah they're all waiting for Do it. you think, like, 15 years from now, like, they'll remake the, these Pokemon games again? Probably. And again. Yeah. And again. Yeah. And again. Because there's always going to be kids right. that are 30 now. And the technology is always going it. to advance. Yeah. Especially for Nintendo because it's so b- far behind the curve. Yeah, well, especially the Pokemon games. I mean, looking at this remake of Diamond and Pearl, like, it's not that good looking. No, this rem- it's like... It's like a remake that could have been made at the time the originals came out. It feels like it could run on the 3DS. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Minus the character models. Character models are a little too have too many smooth curves for 3DS. But the it's rest not, of it, it's not too far off. It's really like, not. Pokemon. Yeah, I know there's a big divide in the fandom over like some people are fine with what Pokemon is. Some people are like these are this is the biggest IP in the history of mankind. Yeah. Why do these games look like this? And I think that's a valid. You know, it's not going to stop me from playing, but I think that's a valid question at this point. We'll we'll talk about Arceus in a minute, and that game's not looking a whole lot better. No. To put it bluntly, um, it does look better. It's an open world game, um, but. Not that much better, technically, to be honest. Um, the new information that was released about uh, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl is that there isn't that much new <laughs> information mm-hmm. or content coming to them. They are pretty much just very faithful re-representations of the original games. Um, one of the new features is that players can socialize with other trainers from around the world in the Union Room. Um, you can personalize your experience by using the capsule decoration. Sure. Um, and then both the games, both versions of the game, will be compatible with Pokemon Home in 2022. And then there's a new Switch Lite coming mm-hmm. that's themed, themed around these this, games. Yeah. yeah. Of course there it's is. It's like black and it's got like Pokemon looking stuff on the back of it. Is it brilliant? It No, it's not. Does it shine? It does not. It's matte. What actually. are you trying to pull on <laughs> <Yeah>. us? <laughs> What do you remember about Diamond and Pearl? I don't remember that very, much. Very little. I remember that for the review, uh, we made Paul Bonanno dress as Prince in a bathtub full of diamonds. <laughs> really? Of diamonds and Pearl. Diamonds and Pearl. Yeah, Diamond and Pearl. I get it. Um, I, I, I thought of that in a meeting, and for some reason they did it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's one of those things you throw out. I'm like, like, why, I, why did I say that? I didn't, I didn't mean that for that to be that serious. And then someone runs with it. Yeah, and so there's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's just him as Prince, like holding a Wii controller, like, eh. like it's just, it's, it was, and like you, it's one of those things from back then. You look at it, it's like, is that was that racist? Did we do something wrong there? Well, it I, depends. Maybe, we didn't like nobody painted him up or anything. Okay. It, was, it was just Paul with a mustache on oh, okay. the hair, the hair like no, in, that's in a fine. bathtub. Yeah, but it's just like I don't know. It was. It's one of those things where it's like, I don't know. Like, yeah. We probably well, wouldn't do that today. Well, back then, right, just because you wouldn't even want to take the risk of it. Yeah. But back then, like. Because it's also because it's not funny. It's not it's funny. Not, it's well, like, I mean, it could be if I mean, it's, it's one joke. It's a one-line joke, and we turn it into a three-minute skit. Like, that's, that was that was what X-Play was at the time. You know, you, needed, mean, you needed to fill the, you need to feed the beast. That was yeah. a hungry show. Was that, that when point. you were doing, like, the four episodes a week or whatever? Uh, we were still at three episodes a week, but we had hit the point where, like, um, We'd hit the point where we had to kind of produce stuff that uh, every you know there were mandates to make everything a skit oh. as opposed to like you remember the period you were there and a little bit after it was more like we did it when we wanted to or we had an you know if you had we an idea it, we had a good idea yeah we yeah. had an idea for something you shot it and put it and made it yeah. part of the segment if you didn't you just wrote a review Rated a great did a great video review. yeah and yeah. it just sort of naturally averaged out to like one or two reviews in every episode would have a couple of little skit live action things in it yep. Uh, and then suddenly it became a mandate. Everything had to have that, and the shows had to have themes running through them and things. Like that. And so that was a lot of forced. But again, stuff we would happening. do that when it made sense, right? But but like now but it became then a, it, it became, became like a, what's our themed episode demand. this week? Yeah, and it's like yeah, you understand that when when I did the desert episode, the fear, fear and loathing thing, I, I that was a, I had a month to yeah. pl- to shoot that. Yeah, like, like was, the eighties episode that I did, like that was something that was worked on for weeks and yeah. weeks. It wasn't just like, like hey, it's non- Tuesday and we need an yeah, episode. Or like on the Thursday. non-denominational winter season guide. Like right. That was we pl- started playing that right before Thanksgiving. Yeah. You know, it was like there yeah. were that stuff required. No one understands lead time. Nope. So yeah, but yeah, that's the only thing I remember about Diamond and Pearl. <laughs> is, I remember is, very little about it. Um, I don't think there was all that much that was remarkable about no i think it's only remarkable if you were 12 at the time yeah as with so many of these these games that's kind of true um but it's not getting many updates other than the visual quote unquote Mm -hmm. upgrade which is minimal it's not getting a lot of new features or cool stuff um that you might expect from these types of games next up the game that i think most people are really waiting on Pokemon Legends Arceus. It is an open world action RPG Pokemon game that people have been clamoring for for literally decades. Mm-hmm. Um, we got the initial trailer for it. Was that from E3 last year? Yeah. I believe so. Um, it looked okay, but even in the trailer, it stuttered really bad. Mm. There was <laughs> The trailer had poor frame rates, which is pretty out of the ordinary. Um, this trailer, things seem to run a little better. And by the way, Ten minute, a ten minute trailer, man. Mm-hmm. They released a ten minute trailer for this. I mean, um, they're they're pushing this thing hard. They yeah. are, and they should. 
Um, it one, still doesn't look very good. I know. I know. Um, one thing we should have mentioned, actually, is they re- announced release dates for both of these games. Um, Diamond and Pearl, brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, is coming out November 19th. Um, I believe the Switch Lite is coming out like November 5th, though. Hmm. I think it's coming out before the game. And then Arceus is coming out January 28th. So it's just barely All missing. Right. Um, that's actually sooner 2021. than I expected. Yeah, I thought like middle of the year next year or something, or maybe March. Best, yeah, best yeah case I, was betting, I was kind of betting March. That's what I thought too, um, but that is not the case. It is coming out like at the end of January as the year turns over. Um, and we got a bunch of new details on this game as well. It's like, um, a, it's like a prequel to the whole series, right? It kind of is. Like it takes place in the Sinnoh region before it was called the Sinnoh region. Mm-hmm. Um but you're building like the first Pokedex. Yeah. Yeah. It's called the before it was called the Sinnoh region, it was called the Hisui region. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um before the colonizers came. Yeah, but you're right. It is kind of an origin story for Pokemon mm-hmm. in general. Um it is, as we said, it's a kind of an open world action driven Pokemon game. I think the battles are still turn based though. Seems to be. I know, like, like you're out in the open world, and you can just throw the ball at them and, like, catch them. Um, but I think once you decide to fight them, I think the battles do go to turn-based. Um, but still, it's an open-world Pokemon game that people have been clamoring for for a long time. And as you can see, there are mounts to help you get around mm-hmm. the open world. Or monsties, if you will. Right. <laughs> that's that's true. Did uh, you see Klepik wrote an article entirely about why they're called that? No. I thought it was I thought it was funny because so many people hate that word. <laughs> Did he was he was it like a was he writing as like a comedy piece? No, or? he literally tracked down why it's called that. Like uh, he trans- local and it turned out because I guess the Japanese word is a com- combination of like like monster and best friend or something. So the the localizers combined monster and bestie, and that's why they're called monsties. I think if Patrick, if I were Patrick's editor, and he had come to me with the idea for that, I probably would have said no. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think there's other stuff you can spend your time on that we better use your time. I don't know. I read it. I read it. You did read it. I did not. He got the click. <laughs> so maybe I'm wrong. I'm like, why way. is this stupid word a thing? <laughs> Tell me. Oh, that's that makes it so much worse. Yep. Uh, so we did learn some. So th- they show battles. It looks like they're turn based. Yeah, they they do look turn based. Or if they're not, they're kind of like a weird hybrid. Yeah, which could be cool if they found a different yeah. way to do the battles that aren't just the same as they've always been. Like it does feel like kind of a test balloon of like, hey, is this what you want Pokemon to be from yeah. now on, kind of thing? It like, could be one of those things where if it doesn't sell well, we never see anything like it again. True. So true. you might want to think about supporting this, even if it doesn't look <laughs> overly attractive to you. God, even the cutscene doesn't look like it's got a good frame rate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I am interested in this. Like, I like the like. It feels like I always thought this is where the the ser- the, you know, the series is going to evolve long before this. Yeah. Like it. it seemed- yeah. Like I thought it would happen back on the GameCube. Yeah. Like I think everybody did. I but think people, it didn't. people were. I mean, people have been waiting for the quote unquote three D Pokemon game for almost twenty years. Yeah, yeah, it's taken way too long. Uh, but we do have some more details on how the game works. Um, so as we said, it takes place in the Hisui region. There is a location inside the region called Jubilife Village. It's a, in Nintendo's words, a bustling settlement that serves as a base of operations. Um, and then one, while you're at Jubilee Village, that's where you kind of get your quests. Um, and then after you get a quest, you go out into the open world um, to study one of the different regions or areas of the Hisui region. Um, you go out, you do survey work, you battle Pokemon, and then you return back to Jubilee Village. Um, and once you get back there, that's where you can heal your team of Pokemon. Um, you can also use the base's camp uh, workbench to craft items. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that crafting coming to Pokemon? Mm, it's fine. I feel like it kind of has to be there. There's been some stuff like that before, anyway. So he's kind of like, yeah, and especially because it seems to be so taking so much inspiration from Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Um, Do you I'm think that's all, what I they're doing have, here? Hmm? You think that's what they're doing here? A little bit, yeah. Trying to Breath of the Wild eyes. I mean, in the in the original Pokemon. trailer, they even did the Breath of the Wild like fly over the hill with the guy standing on it. That's shot. true. I mean, it's straight that's, out of Breath, that's Breath of true. the Wild trailer. Yeah. Also, my bet is that um, you know, that's Team Galaxy is who you're for. There's no way in hell Team Galaxy doesn't become Team Rocket. Well, yeah. Like that's obviously like these are the Rocket people. I would think so. That's why the lower third says Pocket mm-hmm. Rocket. Yeah. And, like, also, like, Oak Oak said he was the one who invented the Pokedex 
in the, in the original Pokemon. So what this means is he stole this stuff from these people, <laughs> and Team Rocket isn't evil. They want their shit back. Ah. Uh. Hmm. You stole my Pokédex. Stole the Pokédex. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that they could do with this that yeah. could change the direction of the franchise. Or I how never you trusted that it. oak bastard anyway. <laughs> so like, I, anything you can do to like reveal the truth about that guy, I'm all about it. He smiled too much. The Abram says Galaxy Team are the bad guys from Gen 4. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. I remember that now. Uh, Vincent says Galaxy is Galaxy in Diamond and Pearl. Mm. Yep. I mean, if you got a space-related name, I guess you're a bad guy in Pokemon. <laughs> that's just how it works, apparently. Um, they haven't really announced much about like new Pokemon being debuted in this, and I can understand why, mm-hmm. because yeah. if this is a prequel, you'd have to explain how if there's Pokemon you've never heard of, what happened to them, that you didn't discover them in the later games. Right. Well, which I could guess become they could complicated. go extinct, I guess. Right. Yeah. And maybe that's part of the story mm-hmm. is Pokemon going extinct, which would be an ironically or an odd Oddly serious twist to a Pokemon. I don't game. know. You have, it's, you know, like Black and White dealt with some real stuff here and there. Yeah, uh, Black and White was the only real yeah. Pokemon story, in my opinion. Yeah, I, rem- I mean, I remember those villains. They were basically Pokemon Peta. Yeah, and, they were. Uh, <laughs> it's the only game to really address the whole thing. It was like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Children cockfight with these things, and, and these the, animals are trapped in these, little, trapped balls. In these little balls, and they're they're the only. They seem to, all animals seem to be Pokemon. There are no like normal. So apparently. They eat them, yeah, and and that's even referenced, you know, in the in the old the original anime. Well, like, here they're actually showing off the combat system. Yeah, in the original anime, they you know, there's a point where Ash and Brock imagine a Magikarp as sushi, right? So yeah, I you, do. That's you definitely right. eat them. Yeah, and then you get into the fact that some of them are sentient, right? And you know, actually can communicate. You know, it's like yeah, it's a little weird. It, <laughs> Never mind that we're in a world where apparently when you turn 13, your parents just boot you out into the world and tell you, like, good luck, go good chase luck. monsters in the tall grass and don't come back until you're a man kind of thing. Like, what, it's, a, like, it's, it's much like Harry Potter. Don't think about Pokemon's world too much. Yeah. It, it'll all come don't overthink yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, they did announce that there are four new Pokemon variants that are going to be in the game, which is just mm. kind of tweaks on existing Pokemon that we already know about. Uh, but they haven't announced a whole lot about what new Pokemon will be coming and stuff like that. Oh, look that. at that. The Pokedex is just, just paper. It's not even, it's not even a it's little handheld thing. It's not even a little thing. machine. Because reasons. Yeah. Because <laughs> apparently they didn't have that technology. The tech didn't exist. But they still had magic balls that sucked animals into a, ti- a six-inch square. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'll be honest. I think this game's going to be huge. I don't see how it wouldn't be. I think it's going to sell like gangbusters. Like even if it ends up with like a seven Metacritic or whatever, it's yeah. gonna be. I mean, even if huge. it's not exactly what everybody wanted from a three D Pokemon game, I think it's gonna definitely be close enough. I mean, just seeing the that little montage of all the different locations, like I could just see Pokemon fans just like their mm-hmm. brains melting out of their ears when they show that. Like, I think it's gonna be huge. Yeah, I still, th- you know, I still don't think like there's an art style thing to be said here, but like. They still don't look very good. I agree. Like, what's Game Freak? Is, yeah, the Pokemon. I mean, company they went from making games for handhelds to trying to make console games in like three years. It's you gotta realize all the people they're competing with have been making. Yeah, console but even games like when they along. make like even stuff like Pokken Tournament or like you know the, the Pokemon never really look very good. Well, they, that was Bandai Namco that made yeah that game. But, which, yeah. And they're not they're not making handheld games. They just made right. that's apparently just what Nintendo and Pokemon Company want the Pokemon to look like. Yeah. Um, I mean, I get the style of the Pokemon. Yeah. That doesn't mean that technically they can't have smooth curves and have detail to mm-hmm. them and all that sort of stuff. I think you see it when you look at some of like the CG trailers for stuff like Pokemon yeah. Go. And um, they look pretty good in the new Pokemon Snap. They do. Yeah, for the most part. But there's a lot more they can do with this franchise to make it look way better. Like the engine that they're using for this game, it's just... Not mm-hmm. quite there. Like I'd love to see them look like they did in like Detective Pikachu. Yeah. In the movie. Yeah. Like I thought that was a good. Yeah. It was uh, a good compromise on kind of the classic style versus something that looks like it could exist in a real world. Agreed. Yeah, I thought it looked awesome. And eventually, look, Nintendo's going to have a console eventually that's powerful enough to do that. Mm-hmm. So what are they going to do? Are they going to keep making them look cartoony, or are they going to take it in a different direction? I don't know what the right answer is there. I feel like if you took it in a more realistic direction, you might lose some of the kids. Yeah, you do risk alienation a little bit if you take it too far in that. Yeah. But I also feel like you might attract back some of the older players who love Pokemon as kids. Yeah, although I think you're going to get a lot of them anyway. Yeah. 
Like it's hard to resist what you're seeing there. If you, it's if like you this stuff here, this CG. Like I would be okay if a Pokemon game looked like this. Yeah, but then you go and look at the real game. <laughs> it's it doesn't look like that. Um, but I do think this game's going to be gigantic because um, I think it's going to transcend people who just like Pokemon. People who own a Switch that like open world action RPGs or open world RPGs will want will want to play it too. Um, and again, even if it doesn't get amazing scores, I still feel like it's going to be a smash success financially. Mm-hmm. Um, and Vincent brings that up a good thing. He says, as a reminder, Detective Pikachu 2 is going to be coming eventually as well. There's a sequel to the film coming. And that may change our impressions of Pokemon and what they should do with it in the future as well. Um, but I think we can both agree this is a step in the right direction and a pretty big step in the right direction to have a 3D open world game in this franchise Mm-hmm. It's it's a big deal. Yeah. So we'll see how they do with the execution. Um, again, if you want to watch all this stuff with audio to kind of learn all the details about it, it's on Sifted right now. Um, it ended up taking up like half of the half hour for the presentation. Um, so they focus focus on yeah. it a lot. I, think I mean, a lot as they it, probably should. Like they're, they are putting a lot of weight and effort behind this yeah, thing. Yeah, they should. I mean, especially... As much as we criticize the look of it, like, this is a very yeah. ambitious game for a Pokemon entry. And look, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, some of the team members who worked on stuff like Breath of the Wild came over and were like, Yeah, I hey, would think they had that. I bet, I'm sure Monolith, yeah. like, helped a little bit, like, Absolutely. You know, as they did on Breath of the Wild. Yeah, I'm sure they have a, they've had, like, a team... Like there's a, there's an element to this that feels similar to Breath of the Wild, like Xenoblade Chronicles, yep. and sort of like how that all, you know, Nintendo, Nintendo clearly has that sort of in-house... Um, Style tech going on of, there yeah. like you can build around yep um, so I think it's going to be huge and you don't have to wait too long it'll be out by the end of January provided it doesn't get delayed and I think the other reason that they focused on this so much is that there was just nothing to say about the Diamond and Pearl remakes yeah I mean what are you going to do it's like <laughs> hey come on yeah you like those right come yeah. on in they had they couldn't milk it for any more no. than they did and so they had to focus on this and I think it and people have been waiting for real info on this game forever yep. so it was about time myself included I'm right there with all the people. I mean, it's definitely closer to being done than I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised. Um, And they announced not just like a release window. They announced a hard release date. Pokemon are terrifying creatures. Yeah. Random NPC. You're correct. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So there you go. That's the latest on both Pokemon, the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remake and Pokemon Legends Arceus. Um, It was all part of a Pokemon Presents um, direct basically, that happened this week. Uh, I don't suspect we'll see much more on Diamond and Pearl before they they launch. I have, I'm guessing this was probably one of the big final blowouts for it uh, before they come out. Again, they're coming out on November 19th, and the new um, Nintendo Switch Lite based on Diamond and Pearl comes out, I believe, on the 5th. And actually, maybe Vincent can check me on that, but I think it was the 5th. I think that's what I read. Um, and there you go. Now it's time to preview Gamescom. 2021 um i feel like we're whereas e3 has managed to stay at least somewhat relevant and interesting and entertaining through the pandemic i don't know that i feel that gamescom has managed to do that i mean not last year jeff is still doing his gamescom opening night live is that the name of it Sure. I think that's what it's called. O N L opening it's, night. Live. It's that, or you can mix those words together in a different order, and I'm sure <laughs> and that's it's what all it is. means the same thing. Um, and that kicks off tomorrow, um, today, this morning at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Microsoft really kicked off Gamescom, um, and we'll talk about them first because there's really nothing to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a ve- it was two hours, Matt, and very underwhelming. Yeah. Well, now, no Halo means. That's what weird. That's really weird. There are rumors circulating now that like there's not the co-op campaign isn't coming out at launch. I saw that the co-op is coming in the second wave update. I'm starting to get a little Halo nervous. with no co-op. I mean, what I'm starting to get a little nervous that it's going to make it this year. I mean, I wouldn't. I'm getting to the point. I think where the I, multiplayer will. That's uh, and I believe that that I believe the 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 stuff about the co-op being in this. I think that I think I saw that on an actual like. I think it's legit. Like, yeah, I don't think it's a plan thing. I, yeah. thought, I, mean, I saw it on Twitter, but I think it was a real. I thing. I think it's legit. Yep. Um, I'm starting to get to the point where I wouldn't be surprised if the only thing that releases this year is the multiplayer. I really is starting to look like what. And maybe it, what they it delay the campaign altogether. Could be. Um, I mean, look. How do you the, score that? I don't know. You don't. Looking at the competition at PlayStation, there isn't any. 
Right. So the right. path is open for Microsoft to do pretty much whatever it wants with Halo Infinite at this point and not be worse for the wear for it. Um, I, I was actually watching the presentation on my phone while I was taking a shower today, getting ready to come here. And what struck me was that, you know, Microsoft has carte blanche at this point to do whatever it wants because I feel like already looking down the last three months of the year, like I think Xbox Series X might win platform of the year. Maybe. Think about all the games that you've been playing on Game Pass. What have you been playing on your PS5 that you couldn't play somewhere else? Ratchet. Ghost of Tsushima. That's it. That's about it. Yep. Think about all the stuff you've been playing on Game Pass. And we don't think there's anything for the rest of the year. No. I mean, I don't want to spoil it, but someone asked Pactor that question for this round of episodes, and Cribno's version, no. Yeah. His horizon (laughs) slipped, so. Yeah. That was their big. Basically, we've got Kena and the Bridge of Spirits, and that's it. Basically. I mean, Deathloop. Deathloop, yeah. Those are the two. Um, we just got Psychonauts. It's out there right now mm-hmm. on Game Pass. Um, if Halo comes out, I mean, just think about it. Forza. Stuff. Forza, Horizon 5. I mean. Like, even without Halo. Yeah. That's a pretty big Game Even without Pass Halo. Fall. Even if they were, that's what I'm saying. Even if they were to delay Halo into next year, Xbox mm-hmm. Series X is right now tracking to be platform of the year. Switch might have something to say about it, but I don't think PS5 is even in the conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Um, So that could motivate Microsoft. You know, they're having a pretty good year already. PlayStation's having kind of a rough year. That could play into the decision-making. But overall, like, they did do a big presentation on Forza Horizon 5 today, which, awesome. But, like, I don't need to see anything on that game. No, like, that that is about as known a quantity as it gets. It's like, just put it in my hands. Yeah. I'm good. Like, I I get it. I don't really need to know about the plot or any. I'd rather discover stuff about that on my own at this point. Well, also, it's like, Forza Horizon 5, well, what's the story? Right, like, it's I don't like, care. No. Gonna, yeah, it doesn't matter. A bunch of dipshits go to a stupid <laughs> festival and make life hell for the locals for a week. That's the that's, <laughs> that's the, the story. Plot. That's how it works. Start raiding everybody's barn in the backwoods. Like, what do you do? Yep. Those belong to someone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those cars belong yeah. to somebody, right? Um, so, Xbox, I mean, it wasn't a great presentation. They talked about, like, Age of Empires for way too long. Mm-hmm. They talked about Microsoft Flight Simulator for way too long. It was all stuff like that for the most part, and then Forza. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'd say, oh, well, that's bad for Microsoft. Oh, well, at least they showed up because PlayStation didn't show up, mm-hmm. and Nintendo didn't show up. They're doing nothing for Gamescom at all. And keep in mind, this is mostly a digital event again, but – once again, Microsoft kind of has a stage to itself, and so maybe it feels like it could afford to have a two-hour snooze fest and not be worse for the wear. Um, but let's start talking about the stuff from third parties that has been rumored to show up or people think is going to show up, or Keeley has kind of dropped hints that it's mm-hmm. going to be an opening night live tomorrow. Uh, first up, Saints Row Reboot. Mm-hmm. Um, you've recently expressed your love for the Saints Row mm-hmm. franchise. Uh, are you excited about that to find yeah. out about that tomorrow? Yeah, this is, and actually, I'm curious because this has been my idea for years for this series. When you say reboot, what do you think it means? Well, I, um, I've said this before, I think, on the show, and I actually talked to a, a volition person years and years ago about it, like before Agents of Mayhem came out, and like just talking about Saints Row and things from a job I was on. And I was like, I was like, I've I've always had my personal idea of where they should go after four because four just blows the doors off everything. Got out of hell did too, mm-hmm. and like everything so got so weird and over the top. My idea was always that you reboot Saints Row back to basically square one, like make it like you know go back to like the, the Saints, the GTA clone, yeah. was, but all the characters know it's a reboot. So and they're, they're all incredibly irritated that they can't do all the cool shit anymore. <laughs> and over the course of the, the game, they start like just breaking the rules and make it, to make it more interesting. And by the end of it, everything's just chaos. Again. That's a great idea, Matt. Um, like to the point, it's like you know, like Matt Miller doesn't show up till the third game, but in the first one, they need to hack something. So it's like, let's go get Kinsey and Matt Miller. Well, we don't know them yet. Who cares? We, we, <laughs> we know where they are. I mean, let's go get them. Like stuff like that. Like, Matt, I, I have a feeling that whatever it really is is going to be nowhere near as clever as what you just described. Maybe, but at the, <laughs> but at the same time, like. I'm not going to say it's not that because I feel like that's not a hard thing to come up with. It's not, uh, but... These guys, Volition's good at what they do. Coming up with stuff and getting it greenlit are two True. different things. 
I mean, that is a, that is an easy thing for me to co- pitch as a concept. Actually executing that would be very hard, but it has been like five years. Yeah. So They've had enough time to think Agents about it. Since Agents of Mayhem or whatever, whatever yeah. that was. Yeah. Um, and Agents of Mayhem was a bit of a dud. I don't dislike Agents of Mayhem, but it really... I kind of dislike I it. Can, I can definitely like see... like I didn't like it. I, 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 I liked it okay, but it wasn't. It didn't feel like Saints Row at all. And like, you know, I will never quite understand this series' fascination and insistence that Johnny Gad is so cool because he's a complete zero of a character to me. Yeah. Um. But like, you know, there are a couple characters that crossed over, and it's it's a direct continuation from the end of Gad Out of Hell. But like, I can understand why if you're a Saints Row fan and you picked up Angels of Mayhem, you're like, what the yeah, hell what is, this? is this? Like, yeah. it's, it's definitely it does not at all scratch the same itch as, as Saints Row. They wasted their time. They did on that game. They could have been pushing Saints yeah. forward, and or like they didn't. There could that game. That's a great game in there somewhere. Yeah, it just didn't happen. Yeah, yep. I like a lot of those characters. I'd like to see some of those characters brought. We need forward. more games like this. Is yeah. my contention like we need more open world? action adventure games that aren't all driven by stats and RPG stuff mm-hmm. under the hood. And also aren't driven by like, we're going to tell a mature s- story. Right. Kind of, like just like the Saints Row games have always been unabashedly having fun yeah. with the idea. We, every game that I play doesn't have to make me either cry or make me want right. to fight the developers. That said, <laughs> there better be a sad dad side quest <laughs> chain right. in here somewhere <laughs> with this ripping on that. Tongue I, I, in cheek. Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. Has uh-huh. to, That'd be great. Like the, like the boss has to end up with like some kid <laughs> That they're like, I don't think you're actually my kid. No, I'm like, I'm not your dad. I don't know what this. I like. Where do you want? You want to go fight a troll? What do you? Okay, like it's. I just feel like I feel like that's gotta be in there, right? <laughs> it, um, my guess is it will be yeah. if they're still on their game. Which I'll be honest with you, I'm a little. We'll see. I'm kind of yeah, wondering if that's the case. And it's been so long, you wonder like when, when the story and when the stuff was locked down, right? And whether it's relevant anymore. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, there's, there's a lot of X Factor stuff, but I, I'm I lo- excited to see I it. Lo- yeah, I love Saints Row. I'm glad to see it's still alive. And, and yep. you know, they've been saying for years, it's like, yeah, we're working on something. We don't know when you're going to see it. But we're mm-hmm. so I'm, I, was, I, was, I was actually very happy to see uh, Jeff tweet that. Yep. Like, that was very exciting. I'm excited to check it out tomorrow. Don't forget. Uh, next up, something that should make you very, very happy, Matt. Something we've been wondering about mm. for a while. Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, it still exists, it's still coming, it's going to be shown at Gamescom. When? (laughs) What is taking so long? (laughs) Don't know, Uh, but it is still coming, and it's still moving along. Yeah, I mean, at least it exists, but it's just, it's so weird. Like, I, I shot a segment for this at E3 2019. I know. Like, it's a Lego Star Wars game, why is it taking I mean, it's a Lego game. Really, yeah. if you want to break it down. Oh, so sure, that- but also like, like I mean, Lego Star Wars. That was the first one. That I was know. that. Was, they, they, this is they. They all started. They have all the assets already. Like I, I don't know, man. I mean, I think a lot of this, a lot of this is new. Asset, you know, they, they redid everything the ground up. They're all new. Yeah. They're all new levels, new everything. But mm-hmm. like, I don't know. I just, I just, it's bizarre. Like, I wonder if there'll be like you know more recent stuff integrated, like Mandalorian stuff, or because that doesn't seem like part of the Skywalker saga. So why should it be? You know, the only thing that didn't exist in the Skywalker saga yet by the when they, in E3 2019 was Rise of Skywalker, right? And yeah, yeah, whip together those those levels, but that you know, maybe it was a pandemic thing. Like who knows? I mean, but Luke but, Skywalker is in the Mandalorian. Yeah, but it's not the Skywalker saga. But you could That's shoehorn it. That's all they need, though, man. You could shoehorn it in there because Mandalorian's <laughs> so popular, they need. of course. Yeah. <laughs> they have an in, and they're going to take it. Um, so, yeah, it, we're getting an update on that. I'm assuming we're going to get the release date at Gamescom. We've got to, right? Probably. Yeah. I mean, we got to get the release date. Like, part that. of me think, thinks it's going to be, like, March. I don't think we get this this year. Really? No. That seems crazy. I think, it'll make, I, I think it'll come this year. I think it'll make Q1 next year. I mean, I'll say this too. Like, this looks far more involved than most LEGO games. Somewhat. As far as the variety of what they've shown in the gameplay, the cinematics. I mean, these things got pretty involved in the, in the last few of them. We just haven't really played them because... Why? Know, well, <laughs> They're like yeah. Ninjago or whatever. In, in, yeah, Ninjago and... Uh, the, you know, I didn't play the LEGO Movie 2 one. Yeah, stuff, but, You know, they're... They're just lately the ones. There a lot of the IP they're based on are things I'm interested. Right, in. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Uh, next up, we're supposed to get something Resident Evil Four. It's they're Hopefully saying not it's going to be VR thing again. Right. They're saying the rumors are it's going to be a remake of it. Yeah. But 
they said that before, mm-hmm. and it turned out that there was a VR version of the game being yeah. made. At the same time, we got a GTA Five remaster coming. We got a Skyrim remaster coming. The only remaining one of the holy trinity of remasters is Resident Evil 4. Yeah. <laughs> Those three games will always be on every platform forever going forward, and yeah. Resident Evil 4 needs to join its brothers. I have no problem with that, and I hope it is in Especially because Resident Evil 4 is the only one I really want to play again. I mean, I would love to see Resident Evil 4 with updated oh, graphics. Oh, yeah, for sure, absolutely. Like, I really would. I'm I'm absolutely more willing to buy that than to pay whatever much again for the anniversary edition of Skyrim again. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have Skyrim like five times at this point. Yeah. I have Resident Evil 4 once. To be fair, no, I'm, I, like, I I'm not going to lie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play with Skyrim probably again. Really? I, come, I mean, I probably don't think I'll finish it, but I'll like... Also, to start it up to see what it looks like, and then like forty hours later, I'm like, "What am I doing? <laughs> Why am I in the dungeon of Sarnath again? Like, what's going on? How did this happen to me?" So, do you think we're gonna see the VR game or the remake? I don't know. I hope we see the remake. I think we're gonna see the VR game. Yeah. Like, I'm a, I'm hoping That's for what exactly I want, what and, I and, and, and expecting <laughs> I'm gonna get a thing I don't care about. That's just sort of how I roll these days. Yeah. Um, I think we're probably gonna see the VR game. I think it's just another one of those cases where. People are getting like little tidbits about RE4. Yeah, I mean it doesn't it doesn't make sense to not remake RE4. It doesn't. Like it's if you're gonna do three, yeah, you might as well do four. I think four this is where is it gets on the fringe, better and more though. popular because it's like five was HD. Yeah, but five sucked. So it like did. four is one of the best games of its generation. Like keep yeah. moving it forward. Keep it up. Keep it on. I mean, I, mean, I know make... you can play backwards compatible Resident Evil Four on Xbox now and all that, but like. You can make huge improvements. You can on really RE4. do a lot with this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you're right. Five, six, after that, it's like yeah, yeah. there's no reason mm-hmm. for it yet. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs to think about Resident Evil 6. <laughs> yep. Um, up next, a game that I'm kind of surprised is getting all kinds of play in the pre-marketing for Gamescom. Mm. Do not underestimate the love of the turtles. It's pretty amazing. Do, do not dismiss turtle power. I mean, Jeff sir. has been promoting this as like one of the big exclusives from his show. Mm-hmm. I mean, no. people love the turtles. They do, but dang. And this like, this actually does look pretty darn good. It does. I mean, it's just a new version of the classic arcade cooperative game, yeah. um, which you know, ever ever I think everyone who grew up in that era has fond memories of it. Mm-hmm. And look, even and beyond young, that, because the yeah. you know, versions of that it continued to exist on consoles for years. And afterwards. look, the IP has remained relevant for kids for yeah. ever since. Like you know, I have nieces and nephews that love Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So I think there's a market for it. But at the end, it's really just like an indie beat 'em up. Um, but it's being but as market- always, even as even back in the day, theming is everything on those games. Yeah. You know, there's a reason this one is remembered, and no, and nobody except me remembers Cadillacs and dinosaurs. Yeah, that's true. Somebody, some of us just want to punch a Velociraptor in the face. <laughs> I guess. Um, I also the wonder, like, are cool too. I also wonder what you know Jeff can show because they've already put out a gameplay trailer that shows off the gameplay. Um, I don't know. I just don't know what could be like a big story about this game at this point. Maybe what it comes with, or like it maybe comes with the classic game or something like. Well, packages, you know, like, there's, there's things you can do. I, I honestly, I just think it's slim pickings at Gamescom. There's that too. Because IGN is doing this like. This is going to get eyeballs, though. People are excited about this yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But IGN is doing this huge broadcast. Apparently, they built a new studio here in LA. I didn't even know about it. Hmm. But they're like premiering their brand new studio for Gamescom. And if you look at the. They lit, put out their rundown for it already. And it's just one indie game after another. Mm. I just don't think there's anything out there for Gamescom that is well, going to... the f- schedule's dry in the AAA space, so yeah. that's what you got. And so I think Jeff's is going to be mostly stuff like that. It looks like IGN's broadcast is going to be mostly stuff like that. Like, I would just set my expectations to moderate. <laughs> to, to less than stunned. Yeah, for for Gamescom in general this year. That seem, I mean, that seems... I'm, I'm setting my expectations for almost everything to that this year. Yeah. Except Shang Chi, Shang Chi better blow me away. Yep, because we're still not really out of this mess, unfortunately. No. So, I mean, Gamescom was supposed to be in person originally. It right? was, yeah. yeah. Initially, they announced it was going to be in person. Uh, next up, a game that I'll be excited to learn more about, Dying Light Two. Mm-hmm. It's getting like its own Nintendo Direct. I Fingers think. crossed for no delay. Yeah, yeah. Right, I don't think it would right do me edge. at this point. No, but I mean, I, it would be close though if it did. I mean, I don't care anymore. I lost. I lost the fantasy league this year, but I just want to play this game. Yeah. Um. It's right now scheduled for December sixth. Mm-hmm. 
and they put up pre-orders today. Well, that's good. That's a good sign. Which is sign. a good sign. Yeah. So it looks like it's coming. This could be like the Grinch that saves Christmas for a lot of people. Like <laughs> Especially if you're a PlayStation owner. I mean, that's not what Grinches do, but... I know. It's just a play on words. <laughs> <laughs> it could literally be the game for PlayStation owners for the holiday season yeah. with no big exclusives coming out that people are going to be clamoring Even though for. I'll probably get it on Xbox. But what? It's on Xbox, right? Yeah. It's yeah. on everything. I'm just saying PlayStation folks are going to be looking it's for something stuff to new play. To yeah. get, you know, yep. Uh, otherwise, so, it's sort of like enjoyed San Andreas. Pretty much. Which a lot of them will. Sure. <laughs> Just gladly they will. Um, so anyway, we should, we're getting a big like new direct on Dying Light 2. It was also shown today in the Microsoft thing uh, because they were scraping for content too, apparently. Um, another game that's going to be blown out, and it makes sense, is Far Cry 6. And that is because it's coming out pretty soon. Mm-hmm. And it's, Ubis- it's really Ubisoft's last chance to kind of blow it out. So I expect any show... Mm-hmm. That's happening from quote un- from quote unquote Gamescom. Yeah, we'll have Far Cry Six in it. <laughs> Will we finally find out what that red fog is? <laughs> I don't know, but that's make... the one thing we still don't know about this game is they showed like the red fog, people spraying the red fog, and like the, mm-hmm. the crop dusters throwing the red. So that's something. I assume that's the that's psychedelic the drug whatever, of this. Yeah. Game, you know, because Far Cry <laughs> always has some kind of drug thing. in It, it does. Yeah, they, but they just haven't talked about that yet. My guess is Ubisoft will make as many trailers as it needs to to make sure that this game is in every single thing at Gamescom. Yeah, probably. This is its last chance to market it before it comes out. And Far Cry in general kind of handles its own marketing. It has a fan base. People mm-hmm. are going to buy it no matter what. Uh, but I mean, you, I'm as, in. As we've learned with Ubisoft, stakes is high. I'm also in uh, for the remake of Blood Dragon that comes with it. No, oh. I like that one. Yeah, it's a cool game. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see where they go with some of the the real world ramifications of this game because mm-hmm. like it doesn't feel like a great time to be releasing a game that's sort of based on Cuba. No. Um, especially when it's not Cuba. You know, it's like we basically ripped Cuba off to make it Cuba. You know, it's like, it's not called Cuba, but we're just like, it's, you know, Cuba with a serial number filed right. off kind of thing. <laughs> and it's just sort of, Oh yeah. have a great time blowing stuff up in the, this place that's having a really bad political situation right now, and you're going to have to pull the same Ubisoft not political thing. Right. Even though you have clearly made a political game about a real-world place that is having political strife right now and has for... I mean, pick one. Timing couldn't be like, better. Like, you can do that. Or you worse, can, yeah, depending you can, on your perspective. You can, make, you can tackle that idea. You can absolutely do that, but it's like... Admit it. Like, pick a lane. Yeah. Or, or make up a totally fictional place. They've never really done fictional places post-3. Yep. Like there's you know you know four was very clearly Tibet. I mean they always and, rename them, but you yeah. know what they're supposed to be. Yeah. Well, they didn't rename Montana. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Only America, I guess. Yeah. They're like, oh, we're cool to use the name. No one will care. What's Montana gonna do? Yeah. Yep. They know. Uh, and you may be surprised to hear, but that's pretty much Gamescom 2021. Mm-hmm. We just whipped you around Gamescom in like eight minutes because that's really what's gonna be there. There may be a surprise here or there. But that's really the bulk of Maybe the big games. it's a good thing it wasn't in person. It, it is a good thing for a bunch of reasons. It'd be a pretty empty floor. I mean, there wouldn't be a lot to play there. I think the people who went would be disappointed. Mm. And then you multiply that by the risk of right. spreading a very infectious disease around Europe. Um, I think it was definitely the right decision. So I think it's working out for the best, ultimately. Um, but, I, again, I would just set your expectations down a notch or two from where they usually are for Gamescom. Um, as always, we'll be covering it on Sifted. Um, we'll have all the hot stuff as soon as it uh, it breaks. It will be up on up on the website and be filtering through your sifts. Um, so if you don't want to spend a ton of time on Gamescom, come to Sifted. Your sif will get will bubble up all the important stuff right at the top of the page for you. Um, but yeah, it'll be great to kind of get back to normal next year with E3 and Gamescom. God willing, mm-hmm. this ends and we actually get back to normal next year. Here's the thing: is not. Well, it's never going to end. No, I mean, the, there's new data that came out that like shows that um, the Pfizer dose after four months, after you know, the three point something million Kaiser patients or something, it's like basically protection, especially against Delta variants, down like fifty three percent with the Pfizer at this point, but ninety three percent protection against hospitalization and death. Yeah, which is the important. Uh, we are officially basic. I think we are officially saying like we we can't get rid of this thing. But we can live with it, and we can turn it into just another coronavirus, but the only tool we have to do that is vaccines. Yeah, that's discouraging. That's this really thing will be around for... Ever, ever, it sounds like. Yeah. It's insane. 
Our world just. But it will become the, yeah. But it will become a thing that like. You know, you don't have to be afraid of every day or don't worry about that much as long as you have your vaccinations done. And, you know, if you don't, there'll be a point where you if pay you the get price. It, you're going to die. I mean, you, that's a chance. I yeah. mean, if you look at the variants, and that's not even include. <laughs> that's not even including the long term effects. Because imagine what you get the variant it. is going to be in eight years. Oh, the variants can be anything. If you choose not to vaccinate at that point, it's like. Probably 100% well, even, death rate. Well, even then, you're worried about the variant that will show up eventually that is immune to the vaccine. Right. Yep. It can get us. Sucks. But hopefully we have Gamescom in E3 next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, and look, life is we're, – we're sitting together in a room right now doing a right. show. So obviously things have improved a great deal. Sure. But um, at the same time, party like it's 1999. <laughs> I wouldn't say that too loud. We don't want to go all purge up in this place. <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's Gamescom 2021. Um, as I said, we'll be curating all the big content from the show all week long at sifted.net. All right, let's move on. I'm going to talk next about Call of Duty Vanguard. We discussed it very briefly on last week's show because all we had was a teaser trailer. Well, the big blowout happened this week. And what a blowout it was, Matt. Did you follow this news at all? Vaguely. Um, it ended up being pretty cool what they did to yeah. debut it. Did you hear about it? Mm-mm. So was this the in-game thing? Yeah, the Warzone thing. And I didn't participate because I thought it was going to be stupid, and now I kind of regret it. Um, but basically how it worked was you joined into Warzone. They'd squad you up with 31 other players, so you'd be on a 32-person squad. And then it was like PVO, like player versus object. It was you and 31 other players trying to take down a train. <laughs> And so you're using, like, your rockets and all your weapons, and there's just a speeding, like, steam train, like, going down the tracks. And you, once you destroy it, then it basically fired off the debut trailer for Call of Duty Vanguard. Um, they're saying that, that what they did to debut Vanguard in Warzone is going to be kind of what Warzone is going to become under Vanguard, meaning they're going to do this PVO stuff going forward. It's not going to be all of it. You're going to be able to play your typical, you know, Battle Royale stuff. But, like, the tweaks that are coming to Warzone from Vanguard are kind of stuff like that, uh, which is a cool little twist on what they've been doing in Warzone all this time. Um, so, anyway, debut trailer was basically a trailer for the campaign. And um, let me just play that for you guys right now. And I'll quickly run down what the campaign is all about. Um, it includes four uh, includes major battles from all across the four main theaters of World War II. Um Probably the big change for it is that it has destructible environments. And I think they're going to make it over to multiplayer, too. Uh, They didn't talk a ton about multiplayer at the reveal. It was mostly campaign-related stuff. But they finally caught up with with, uh, Bad Company 2. Hmm. (laughs) After how many years ago was that? Uh, But they're finally going to have destructible terrain in a Call of Duty game, which better late than never, I guess. Um you get it, just like you got in World War II, Call of Duty World War II. You can mount weapons on objects. Um, you play as part of the world's first multinational special forces unit, um, and your goal is to pursue information around Project Phoenix, which is the Nazis' plan to reestablish the Third Reich after it became clear that the Nazis were going to lose the war. Uh, Activision is saying that all four characters are based loosely on real soldiers. I would guess very loosely. Yeah. <laughs> Would person be. in a uniform with a gun that's, that's technically based on a real person yeah <laughs> exactly um and that's all the information they've given about the campaign it does jump all over the place and you mm. play as like multi all four of the people who are in your elite unit or whatever it's very battlefield yeah it is they are kind of and i hope it's not as bad as a battlefield campaign. i would i mean yeah <laughs> like, that would be for really all my bad. disinterest in call of duty they've always been better at narrative oh than dice is yeah it's like night and day and look, I keep holding out hope that Dice will figure it out someday. It they just never do. Um, Even Battlefront Two didn't. You know, you've already got an advantage with me with Star Wars, and that even campaign that was a wasn't hard great. Play yeah, at times it, it was, was hard just, to play. Yep, it wasn't as bad as uh, no, Battlefield. not at all, not at all. But like, <laughs> still, it still wasn't great. You have a lot more to play with with Star Wars than you do with just yeah. like bro military, whatever. Um, so that's all the information on the campaign. Um, there are, as far as multiplayer is concerned, they didn't talk about much. They said there's going to be 20 maps on launch day. That's a big deal. That's a lot of freaking maps for launch day. Usually it takes Call of Duty a good six to eight months to get out to that number Mm. of maps. Um, but there, there's one thing that a lot of people hate that I actually like. 
that they're bringing back and people are pissed off about. They are bringing back Cold War's skill-based matchmaking system, meaning that if you're good, you're playing against other good players instead of playing against crappy players where you roll up your kill counts. I know it drives Call of Duty YouTubers crazy and Call of Duty Twitch Twitch folks crazy, and that's why I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Because they're no longer able to just go prey on the noobs and have games where they get 57 kills and three deaths. They're actually playing with people who are as good as them, and it makes them salty because they're not dominating all the time. Welcome to everybody else's world, (laughs) where you play some games of Call of Duty and you get your ass kicked. That's the way it is for most people. Uh, And the most important thing of all, Matt, for me, anti-cheat software, Mm. which honestly I think it's the biggest thing for everybody else too. Um, It has really killed Cold War for me. Um, and I'm not alone in that. There's other people who complain about it just as much as I do. We'll see if it works. Um, it could just be lip service to try to get people back on board, which I wouldn't be surprised at at all. Right. We'll see how long it lasts. Right. We'll see how long it lasts. We'll see if it actually works. Um, because so the cheats are different. Like on PC, the cheats are all software. Mm-hmm. Cheaters on consoles are using hardware. Right. Are they going to be able to figure out how to circumvent those dongles that people are using for auto fire and auto aim? I don't know. I mean, if they do, the dongle people will just figure it out in a week. So right, they'll get a firmware update for the dongle, and it'll go. It'll mm-hmm. work like a week later. So I don't know if like unless an they were to prepared it. to really have an arms race on this thing, that's not going to really matter beyond like yep. the first week of launch. It sucks. It really sucks. Um, zombies are coming as well from Treyarch. Um, this game has really turned into a team effort. Um, there was a while a where, vanguard, you might say. Yeah, I mean, there was a while a while where. There would still be, like, a lead developer on yeah. the game, and then the other guys would kind of kick in. Yeah, now it seems like they just sort of combine all the components and yep. call it Snap it together it. and come like up with a You can't title. identify things as a Treyarch Call of Duty or a Sledgehammer Call of Duty anymore. Yep. Uh, there's also an all-new map coming for Warzone, which, if you're a Warzone player, is a massive deal. Or if you're a, a player of any Battle Royale game. Yeah, a new map a new in map Battle is Royale a huge is a big deal. deal. Yeah. Um, and so that's coming as well for Warzone. And then let's talk a little bit about the early access. Actually, before we do that, let's talk about the fact that in this trailer, it never says Activision anywhere. Yeah, I noticed that. It says at the beginning, a Call of Call of Duty presents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Call of Duty isn't named in a lawsuit. Yeah. Call of Duty presents. Like a, a video game franchise presents. Remember when I said you couldn't probably rehabilitate the Blizzard name? Right. They're not even putting Activision in there. They're not even trying. They're not even trying. They're not putting Activision in there. Blizzard and Blizzard as a trademark name is going away. That's crazy Mark to think word. about. Mark my words. That's crazy to think about. Um, and then um, the other part of it is that uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, Twenty minutes. Cle- ago. Clearly, they they beat it, and it's oh, oh, time sl- to roll oh, the trailer. And then after that, sledgehammer. And then it says a sledgehammer game. Mm. So it says presented by Call of Duty, a sledgehammer game. So sledgehammer is the lead on what the campaign or the they multiplayer? They did mostly the campaign. Okay. Yeah, and I think they're doing the multiplayer too. Mm-hmm. So maybe there's kind of a lead developer on this one. Um, and then let's talk about the early access. Treyarch definitely seems to have jurisdiction over zombie stuff, though. They make the best zombies mode. It's not even close. I'm not even a big zombies fan. But their zombies mode is the only zombies mode that I can play and tolerate. Um, so, yeah, they are kind of the kings of zombies. Anytime that they mention them making a the zombies mode, that's a huge selling point for Call of Duty fans. Um, and let's talk about early access because the early access for this game is extensive and it's a hell of a lot better if you own a PlayStation. Pretty much everything has been catered towards PlayStation owners, that marketing yeah, deal. Which we expected. We did expect it. Um, but it's pretty crazy. I'm curious uh, how long that'll last. I don't know. Like because if we'll see a shift to Xbox over the current The tides are turning, generation. Matt. The tide is turning. It really is. I, that's a realization I've come to over the last couple of weeks is like, this isn't status quo this gen. Sure, Sony's going to sell a bunch of PlayStation still, even though people don't have a lot to play on it. But eventually people are going to start to realize there aren't any games. Um, that's only going to last so long where you're like, we'll just buy Ratchet. Just buy Spider-Man. Just mm. buy Demon's Souls remake. People are gonna be like, dude, those games are two years old. Like, why would I buy those now? When mm. I have new games coming out. Because you for haven't Xbox. played it. Right. But and you still. only just got a PS5 last week because right. there wasn't any in the damn stores. Right. But they're like the not they're not the hot new stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. They're like these old the games. The console is still the hot thing. Right. You're not no one's even talking about what they're buying to play right. on it. Yeah, it's crazy. They just want the system. You just want to own the console, exactly. And you wonder if how many people finally get it, and then, then like, they're like the dog that caught the car. You're like, okay, now what? Yeah. 
They're like, well, I caught you. Now what do I do I with you? I guess I play Miles Morales again. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's like, Which isn't very long. No. I mean, neither is really Ratchet. No. You could get through both of those games in a weekend. Yeah. But also, you know, it doesn't always have to be hot new stuff. Like, there's always... There's third-party stuff coming. Yeah. Well, and also, like, guess. if you haven't... If you didn't have the PS5 yet, there's plenty of stuff you haven't played on it yet. And, like... I don't have plenty, but there's stuff. Yeah, there is. Like, no one no one can play as much stuff as we do most of the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I get that. I, I know a couple of people that are playing Ghost of Tsushima for the first time on the PS5. Yeah, because yeah. the director's cut's coming out. Yeah, because and because they never played it on PS4. And they're lucky that they're playing it for the first time on the PS5. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's get into some early access stuff because, as I, as I said, it was extens- It is extensive. Um, August 27th to the 29th, if you own a PlayStation 4 or a PlayStation 5, you can get in on the alpha. The, it's not a multiplayer alpha, though. It's, it's just one mode called Champion Hill, but it is like the big, new, shiny mode for Vanguard multiplayer. And it's basically like... Dozens of teams of two or three players. Um, yes, eight teams actually. Eight teams battling it out in either two versus two or, or or three versus three, and it's kind of a mashup of a gunfight and a battle royale put together. Um, there will be four different maps to play on during the alpha, and the object is to try to eliminate the other team before they are taken out. Uh, and then there, you can change your loadout between each round so it's like a round base take out the other team before your team with a combination of gunfight and battle royale um, and that's all that's going to be in that alpha for playstation owners and then on september 10th that's when you get like the real beta which is where you'll get to play some multiplayer and again that debuts exclusively on playstation first before it goes to the other platforms my guess is September 17th, you'll get it on Xbox and probably PC, maybe PC. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of Call of Duty coming down the barrel here in the next 30 days or so, which makes sense because it's coming out on November 5th. Uh, so as usual, they have this very tight window to market stuff. But the thing with Call of Duty is that so few new features get added to each entry that you don't need more than like three months to market it. It yeah. sells itself to eighty percent of its audience anyway. Well, like you, you know, mainstream marketing, you need only need three to four weeks. Yeah, you know, I always tell the story. You have enough money. Of, yeah, well, I, yeah, for AAA stuff, sure. But I always, I always tell the story of you know Force Awakens, where you know we had been discussing Force Awakens at football Sundays for the whole season. Yeah. Every Sunday, we're talking about what this or this teaser or that, that, and then the Thanksgiving week. We were watching, and uh, and this, a, a woman who was there for most of the football Sunday had been in the same room with us and just was really good at tuning us out because we're a bunch of nerds. <laughs> um, like, they ran a commercial for Force Awakens. It was the first marketing push for Force Awakens because it was coming out like three weeks at that point. Mm-hmm. And she's, she said, oh, my God, they're making a new Star Wars movie? <laughs> And, like, that's how people find out yeah. about these things. Like, it's they true. don't follow this stuff like we do. And NFL football kicks off in, like, two weeks, and that's all they need. Yep. They'll find a couple of games where they have like 40, 30 million people watching the game. Throw up that Vanguard trailer a few times and boom, pre-orders explode. Done. Off they go. Uh, so First anyway, thing people do after that game ends, they load up that PlayStation. Yeah, and get that pre-order. Yep. Uh, the only real X factors left for Call of Duty Vanguard that we don't know about is multiplayer. Uh, they pretty much have explained everything else about it at this point, and we'll probably learn all about that firsthand when we all jump in the beta on September 10th. So anyway, that's Call of Duty Vanguard, all the latest information. It does not look like it's going to have a big presence at Gamescom, um, but why bother when you've already just blown it out yourself and mm-hmm. everybody knows what information you're willing to divulge at this point anyway. So uh, that's Call of Duty Vanguard. Let's move on. We're going to talk next about... Humankind, another game that I've been playing this week. It is, the easiest way to describe it is it's a civilization clone. Um, It does do, I would say, a lot of things differently from civilization, but they're more like minute things that only people who have played the crap out of this genre in the past, like me, would notice. Um, I think for most people, if they sit down and play Humankind, they would struggle if you put down Civ Six, Humankind, I think they would struggle to know which one was which. Mm-hmm. They're similar enough that I think for casual players, one could be a replacement for the other. Um, so it is a 4X grand strategy game. It starts in the Neolithic era, 
which means that you're running around with like woolly mammoths, no dinosaurs. No, <laughs> it would have been I awesome mean, if they could have gone back that far. <laughs> well, we don't go back that far as a species. I know so it doesn't make sense. Sixty-five million years. Yep. But um, but there. T Rex lived closer to us than he did to Stegosaurus. I know it's crazy when it puts when you put that it's stuff a in long perspective. Time it is. It is a long time. Just um, like uh, 1980 to to 19, to 2021, same same amount of years as 1980 to 1939. That's mind blowing. Because I'm, I'm just gonna go walk into the sea. Because as a kid, right now, yeah. just, <laughs> as clearly a, we're done. As, like, a, <laughs> as a kid from the 80s, like 1939 seemed like the Neolithic oh, yeah. era to oh, me. Oh yeah, this year <laughs> Star Wars is as old as King Kong was when Star Wars came out. Oh, it's like. 1939, we barely had come out of the Depression. Right. World War II, any, Call of Duty couldn't have been made. It didn't happen <laughs> it didn't yet. didn't happen. I know. It's crazy. Uh, so anyway, it starts in the Neolithic era, and then you can go all the way like to past where we are into the future where you have all this crazy space technology and mm-hmm. everything. Um, so it's the, it cuts a wide path through civilizations. Um I guess for the most part, I'm going to just focus on, and I could talk about this game for a long time, um, and I know most of you aren't that interested in these games, so I'm not going to. So I'm going to try to focus on the stuff that sets it apart, at least for me, the most from Civilization. And the biggest one of them all is that once you choose a culture, you do not have to stick with it. In fact, you don't even have to stick with it very long. Like the Neolithic era lasts for probably 30 minutes, and once you change eras, you can choose a new culture, which some people, it's a double-edged sword. So there's some, there's a reward in sticking with a culture in Civ and seeing it through all the things that that culture does. And if you kind of have a vague idea of history, you kind of know what they might be. And so you kind of look forward to those milestones that that society in itself ended up accomplishing. You can stick, you can, by the way, stick with the same culture in this, but you lose all the bonuses. So you make it through the Neolithic, and then they present you with like six options for the next era. Um, Each one of those has like a unique unit. Uh, They have unique goals, unique science that they can research, and, and buildings that they can build. If you decide not to do that, all you end up doing is getting like a 10% like multiplier. If you stick with the same culture, it'll give you like a 10% multiplayer for sticking with it, but it doesn't give you new stuff um, that you didn't have when you first started playing with that culture. Um, so they ins- they don't want you to play with the same culture. They want you to jump around. And it keeps the game varied. It also allows you... I don't know if this happens with you and Civ. There have been times where I have regrets, yeah. where I get to a certain point in the game and I'm like, I really wish I had not chosen this path. It allows you to hedge your bets, basically. But it also amounts in building this settlement that is like a weird mix of everything. Because you start guilty at getting units. Like your armies end up being like these weird hodgepodge of like all these different cultures. Which is kind of like America, really. Mm -hmm. Um, And then your buildings get that way. Like you can kind of pick and choose how you want to patch like your own settlement together. So it doesn't have kind of this like coherent tone or theme throughout all of it and i think some people will like that i think some people will not like it but it's important that i bring it up because it is a big difference uh from the civ games um one thing i i have have a lot of criticisms of this game honestly um my biggest one is that you hardly even know when big stuff happens so in civ there's these moments where you've like achieved this you've reached the hilt at something And they celebrate it. There's explosions. There's celebrations in game. In this game, like, there's nothing like that. Like, you build, like, this wonder of the world. And they're just like, good job. Here's a star. (laughs) Like, and the stars do drive the game. So how it works is you have to earn era stars from each culture or from each era. And there's, like, 21 total stars that you can get. But once you get to seven stars, the game will prompt you to move to the next era. And like I said, you can stick in the same culture you you did before if you want to, or you can you can pick another one. But cultures are first come, first served. So if you want to be the Mongols or whatever, um, and somebody else who's in the game beats you to it, they got it, and you won't be able to get it. So the, the game does kind of incentivize you to jump and take that next culture because if you don't, it's gone for good, and you'll never get it back. Um, so the game 
a lot of the things in the game that aren't like Civ, they give you ways out, but they're not really ways out. They they incentivize you so much to do what they're trying to tell you to do that you do what they're telling you to do. Um, so it's almost like a faux choice because it's a, such a detriment to not do what the game is organically trying to convince you is the right thing to be doing. Um, and I'll get some B-roll roll into this. It's not the most visually arresting game ever. Um, it's pretty, but there's like... Um, like the map in the game, and obviously you know, every level of zoom for the map in these games is important, and they change. So in Civ, it's like when you're really close, you use that for like battling or just to check out your settlement. Um, but if you want to see like, okay, what's diplomacy like? You go out to like the second level. If you want to see like, okay, who's taking over the whole map? You go out to the third level. The maps, the map, the zoom level in this game and the maps for each one are awful, other than... The, mo- the closest one. The closest one is stunning. When you're actually looking at what you built in your settlement and your citizens going about their day doing their stuff and your livestock and all the stuff that you've built. It's all happening. It's all rendered in 3D and it looks awesome. But when you start zooming out, the map, it also becomes unfunctional in a mm. lot of ways and doesn't do what maps in these types of games are supposed to be doing. So I'm not a big fan of the way the maps are handled <clears throat> in the game, or at least the zoom levels for the maps. Um... I also tried to play this game, Matt, without the tutorial because I've played Civ games for my whole life. And I was like, I should be able to figure this. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Play the tutorial in this game. I I don't think it's possible to play this game without playing the tutorial. Or you can, and you'll figure it out so late in the game that you'll wish you had played the tutorial. Like, just figuring out the, the combat in this is way better than Civ. It's way deeper, um, way more nuanced. There's way more strategy to it. But the AI is terrible. So when you're fighting against a computer, which you are not the whole time, they do really dumb stuff. Like I, there were battles where I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've lost. And they would just like move to another tile and like take a turn off. And I'm like, oh, I guess I didn't lose this <laughs> battle. Um, so the AI does kind of ruin the combat a little bit in the game. Um, but it's really deep. And if you do not play the tutorial, you will have no idea. Manufacturing armies in this. Play in Civ every turn. You have like five armies just pop, 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 pop up on your town because you've generated. Getting new armies in this takes way longer. Um, You have a menu where you choose to build everything, and then you prioritize it in order. To get like one army full of dudes with axes, it's like 15 turns. Hmm. And you have to prioritize it. So you're like, but I also need to build, like, a garrison so that I can increase the speed that I'm able to build my armies. Or I need to build this marketplace so that there's money coming in or whatever. So you have to prioritize all these other things that you should add to your settlement while making sure that you're getting armies. Because of that, my first run through, I decided to do a science run where I just did all research and was like, we're going to be the first society to learn how to write. We're going to be the first society that has the wheel. That was a huge mistake. <laughs> so going back to what I was saying about the AI in battles, the AI is also really dumb on a global level because I had hardly any armies. There was a another settlement or another culture right next to me that had like thousands of troops. And I'm sitting there. I have no one to protect my land. And I have all the crazy, expensive wonders of the world and all the science in the world. I have, like, the most advanced army types. I don't have very many of them, but I could make them. And I got into this hole where I was unable to generate money and resources quickly enough, and I got invaded. And within, like, three turns, wiped off the face of the map. So they're not that stupid. Well, (laughs) <laughs> it became so obvious what they should do. So my, mm-hmm. I guess really my point is that the balance, it's hard to balance science with, or one of those kind of parts of research with the battling in this game. Like I, the, because you're not getting soldiers at a rate that you're used to when you play these games. And there's diplomacy. Um, you can sign treaties. You can bribe other, which is what I found is to be most effective, is instead of like, signing a treaty with them and just signing a treaty. And sometimes they'll say, well, they'll come back and they'll be like, okay, well, I'll sign this treaty if you toss in like 500 gold or whatever. 
And at first I was turning them down, and then they would attack me and just wipe me out. And then after a real while, I realized I should just pay the bribes. If you pay the bribes, they leave you alone. And then you just – there was literally at one point I played this game at probably 30 turns in a row. Nobody attacked me, and I attacked nobody. Hmm. It was just me just building resources at my homestead and building new buildings, building new garrisons so I could make more soldiers. But ultimately at the end of it all – I died. I only made it the first time trying to go through with science. I only made it to like the fifth era. And I think there's, I don't even remember how many there are, but I only made it to the fifth, not even halfway through all the eras. And here's the crazy thing. The win condition in this game is not being the last Civ standing. That doesn't matter at all. In fact, the, the way you win this game is through fame. So as I was talking about earlier, you have the era stars that you need to collect seven of before you can move to the next era. There's also award you with fame, as does building like a wonder of the world or other certain buildings that you can construct, as does spreading your, you know, your influence out across the map, taking over other territories. That all builds fame. And so conceivably, you could be eliminated in the fourth or fifth era and the game goes on. You could still win the game. If everybody gets eliminated and the last team or the last culture standing doesn't have more fame than you, it's it's a lot to wrap your head around, I think, um, particularly if you're used to playing. Here's some of the cultures that you can choose. I think this was for the third era, maybe. I can't remember. Um, so there's just a lot to wrap your head around, particularly if you've been conditioned to play Civ and kind of figure out the the way things have worked in those games in the past. You need to kind of wipe that out of your memory. It'll help you with your strategy. It will help you with growing armies. It'll help you with almost anything. If you just come into this kind of being fresh and not saying, well, that's not like how it worked in Civ. That's what I found myself doing. And my first game was a washout. Second game, build a bunch of warriors, just focus 100% on building armies. And like I had half of the map in like 50 turns or whatever. Um, so brunt the, the blunt force trauma mode in this game is pretty effective. If you try to win through science or research or things like that, it's a lot more challenging. Um, other things that were interesting that happened while I was playing the game, like because I was weak, other cultures would just start sending their soldiers into my territory. And I'd send my team down, and my soldiers were so weak. That was the other problem. My soldiers were like level two. They were like level eight. So I could send like three armies after one army, and they'd wipe out all three of my armies. And so after a while, they would just come in there, and they'd do whatever they want. And they started taking over my, literally taking over the culture. They started, like, preaching their beliefs to my people, and my people started believing them and started leaving and going and living with them. Like, there's a lot of little nuance that was, like, surprising as I played through the game, at least pleasantly surprising. Um, What else? Oh, Fog of War. So you never fully uncover Fog of War in this game. Hmm. You do, but you don't. So you uncover the map, and as soon as you leave it, the fog comes back in, which is annoying. I thought it was annoying. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty standard now. Yeah, I don't know why they do it that way. I guess it would be too easy if they left it yeah, all open. Because, I mean, if you don't have anyone there, you can't see what's going on. I guess yeah, and I guess until you have the technology, yeah, then may Okay, I guess that does make sense, but I found it annoying. Um, the other thing, too, is I sent my scouts out, and they got wiped out. Like, they got all the way to the end of the world, and someone just decided to attack them and killed them all. So I lost, like, pretty much half of my army in one turn. Um, you could definitely get ganged up on in this game where you think you're just going to take this little piece of territory and then the fog of war opens up and there's like five armies and you're surrounded and they just completely mop up mop up uh, the map with your with your ass. Um, but, one, this is free on Game Pass. If you have Game Pass Ultimate uh, for PC or if you have Game Pass for PC, it's on Game Pass as well. Two, I played this for a long time and th- the time just melts away I, I tweeted it like when i first started playing it i literally thought i had played for like an hour and a half or two hours it was like five hours it is a great time waster um as far as just like if you're bored and you're looking for something to do hook this thing up and the hours just <laughs> fly away uh, like like any good 4x grand strategy mm-hmm. game um if you're if you're asking me Shane, I can pick up Civilization VI for like $10 at this point or whatever. Or should I play this or buy this? To me, Civ is still the better game. Mm-hmm. It's just more fun. There, 
there's something about this game that I could not put my finger on. It's just not exciting. Like I said, it doesn't really celebrate like your victories the way Civilization does. But I think there's, I can't, again, I haven't been able to put my finger on it. I don't know why I didn't get excited playing this game. Like it's mildly entertaining and it sucks away time, but I didn't come away from like the over a dozen hours I played this game with like, wow, I remember that moment. I don't. I hardly remember any iconic moments from this. Like, I remember the moment when I figured out, like, how combat really worked because I didn't do the tutorial. Um, I remember, like, the story I just told you about how all my scouts were out way afar from base and they got surrounded and all wiped out in one turn. Like, I remember that kind of stuff. But nothing that I achieved do I remember from this game. I don't even remember, like, hey, I switched to this culture and then I got this really cool unit that I sent out into the field, and I was really happy that I had changed that culture. It's just kind of like this slow and low burn that you just keep one more turn, (laughs) one more turn. Oh, we're going to go to dinner? Oh, I can get two more turns in before we go to dinner. It did hook me in that way. I just didn't have as much fun with it as I've had with the last, like, five Civilization games. Um, I would argue that this is maybe for the more hardcore player, and Civ is maybe for the more casual grand strategy player. Mm-hmm. I think there's more depth to this than there is in Civ. Um, I think this looks better than Civ 2. Um, but, you know, we'll I see mean, what... Civ's a little yeah, old we'll, at this point. Yeah, we'll see what the next Civ looks like. Um, but this is certainly the best-looking grand strategy game on the market at this point. Um, I don't think there's any any denying that. Um, but again, look, it's if, if you have Game Pass and you can get it for free, play it. It will burn up your time. If you've never... Look, I would say play through the tutorials even if you've played a ton of these games because I have, and I got lost at the beginning. If you've never played one of these, definitely play through the tutorials because you will be absolutely lost. The I do not think that the menus are all that intuitive on what they are or how you should use them. Um, so my number one recommendation is absolutely make sure that you play the tutorials before you dive into this. Um, Vincent says there are six eras in the game. Yeah. Um, but I did have fun playing it. It was like this moderate level of fun. I just, it wasn't enough to make me wholeheartedly recommend it to somebody, particularly if you've already got civilization in one of these dozens of deals where it's been free. Like mm-hmm. I think it was on free on Epic game store for a while. Um, and if you're already like neck deep into Civ, or you just have Civ sitting there and you haven't played it yet. And you're like, Oh, maybe I should give one of these games a try. Just play Civ. Um, I don't think that humankind trumps Civ in any way. There are parts of it that are more in-depth and some people would say better. Um, But overall, I think Civ is the better game and, more importantly, the more fun game. Um, I just don't have a lot of fond memories of playing this like I normally do when I play Civ. Hmm. Um, Do you like grand strategy games, Matt? Uh, More in theory. I used to like them more. They don't suck me in the way they used to. Like... I almost failed a couple classes in high school because of Civ 2. Um, I haven't been pulled into a Civilization game or one of these in a long time. Maybe like Stellaris. What's the last one you played? Stellaris was probably the last 4X game that I really got got into. Mm-hmm. Um, my niece does play Civ 6 obsessively and like makes up stories about the PC opponents she's like playing against and like why she hates them and what she's going to do to them when she invades their cities and that's uh-huh. like yeah. So and like that's how I used to be too when I was when I was a kid playing Civ two I was like I, I, I it became a much bigger thing in my head uh, it, independent of what the game presented to me I mm-hmm. you know I did a lot of the work for it um, and seeing her do that kind of in turn with Civ six sort of makes me wonder if like that's just I lost my imagination ability to turn it into that to my, for myself and like it does that's why it doesn't pull me in as much uh, when it comes to four X stuff now I am much more likely to get absorbed by space things. The last 4X game that I played a ton, meaning, like, Mm -hmm. finished it, like, three times, like, felt like I was an expert at it, was Civ 4. Yeah, the last... That's the last one where it took over my life. To to my detriment in a lot of ways. Like, the last game like that that I played really obsessively was Sins of a Solar Empire. I've never played that at all, actually. I love it. It's it's one of the best uh, space-spaced 4X games. If you want to call it a 4X. I mean, technically it is. Like, there's no planetary stuff for the most part other than plugging, you know, buildings and stuff into place on the planets. It's more based in these space areas. You know, a lot of fleets flying around and, Mm -hmm. you know, building, like, installations in the solar system rather than on the planets. But, you you know, each planet does have resources you got to deal with. But, like, 
it just I yeah that it, sins of a solar empire is the, the last remaining one oh civ civ four can still give me a run for my money but like the last one where if I started up at like eight o'clock suddenly it's four a.m. Mm-hmm. and like I'm like oh I, guess I should I should turn this off after the next turn <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> that, like, that's the way those games and are, I'm man, like yeah. to be fair um uh, sins of a solar empire is not turn based oh it's not it's like a real time it's more real time strategy stuff interesting um but I would say it goes in the same Does, is it hex based. No, no. It's, it's just free space. It's free, free movement in, in each solar system. Then you got to jump from system to system. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, but I would argue it's a, it's a similar genre. It's not turn based, but it is. Um, it is the same idea. It's mass mass scale strategy and and management of an empire. Okay. Um, so there you go. Maybe I that's think- it. I don't have the patience for the turn based hex grid stuff anymore. Uh. Uh, so there you go. That's humankind. I think it's a little disappointing. I think my expectations for it were a little higher. Um, but if you don't have Civ and you do have Game Pass and you like 4X strategy games, it's definitely worth playing. It's competent. It's a competent 4X strategy game that does a lot of stuff differently from Civ. And some of it works well and some of it does not. Uh, and I think that's probably the best way I can get en- <laughs> encapsulate humankind. Um, again only available for PC right now. Hard to transfer these games over to consoles. Yeah, you know, Civilization's made the jump though. Yeah. Well, remember Wouldn't shock that... me to see an Xbox version. What was at some that point. version of Civ? It was called Civ Evolution or whatever. Uh, Revolutions. Or... Yeah. yeah. Or was that kind of the consoleized? Baby... Yeah, consoleized Civ. babies first Civilization. But right. I think Civ Six is on stuff now. Is it? I think so. Yeah. I want to say there's a Switch version. There's no reason why it can't work with a controller. Like you can just control the. The mouse, the icon with your stick, and it's like yeah, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be ideal. I mean, look, uh, twelve minutes wasn't ideal either in that regard. But like, I you mean, can you can play, play you can play humankind with just the mouse, one button mm-hmm. for select, the other button deselect, and you just move around. Like, there's no reason it couldn't work on a con- on a console controller. Um, but we'll see if it went, this one ends up making it out for Xbox or not. But uh, it's good that there's an alternative to Civ because at the very mm-hmm. least, I feel like a series like this will push. The team working on Civ to do some new stuff and at least try some new things. Yeah, Civ Six is on Xbox, PlayStation, and Switch. It is like, okay. It can work. Yeah, that would be a good like PlayStation Plus freebie. Civ, mm-hmm. you want to get your money's worth out of a free PlayStation? And lately, they and could it, use something. It definitely cause... hooks you in to buy some DLC. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the other thing. That's something I should have mentioned actually from the top about this genre oh, that's in cool. general. What? Vincent says Crusader Kings 3 was announced for consoles today. That's, oh, cool. a, that's a really good game. That's good. Yeah. One uh, thing I more people should play the Crusader Kings games. Yeah. The other thing I should have mentioned as soon as we started this discussion was that this genre in particular, it's very easy when you get a game at launch to think that it's not very good. Mm-hmm. And then <clears throat> over time, it Improvements morphs. Improvements are made. And... Th- this genre in particular, yeah. I think – has a more positive impact of DLC and DLC updates. DLC and just balancing and it makes con- a huge... you know, contact with the audience and yep. that kind of thing. Like, yep. You know, so this will get a lot You'll better. always have your, you know, there's people who play Civ Six who's like, no, no expansions. Or only yep. play with this expansion and this expansion and that's it. Or like all expansions. You know, uh, they, they generally, these games do a good job of figuring themselves out as they go along. And I'll say this. Humankind's a pretty good start. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think back to... Civ Six at launch. Civ Six was rough in places. It was. I recall. So yeah. I think, as I recall, religion was broken. Yeah, somehow. I think it was. Yep. Yeah. That's the other thing. Religion in this game is kind of like this thing that just lives on the periphery. Like it, you don't really, I didn't anyway, interact with it intentionally. Mm-hmm. Like stuff just kind of happens. Like like I said, they came into, they invaded my settlement, and they started spreading their religion into my settlement, mm-hmm. and that's how I started getting like notifications about religion. But there were no conscious decisions that I personally made about religion playing the game. Hmm. So anyway, they have a good base here, a good start. We'll see how the updates go and see if they can improve it over time like this genre usually does. Um, But yeah, that's it. That's Humankind, only available for PC right now. We're going to close out the show, and I'm guessing you guys probably guessed what we were going to talk about to close out the show. Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut, the Iki Island DLC expansion. Matt, I've literally played about 20 minutes of this, mm. and so I'm glad that you've played more than I have. I played just enough to get the first, like, 20 minutes mm. for B-roll. Um, I played probably about two or three hours of Iki. Okay. Um, I've played about the same amount of New Game Plus. 
because I did start a new game on okay. PS5 because you know just because that's a more direct comparison of what I know mm-hmm. to see the difference. And there is one. There is a difference. Um, the other thing I was surprised by was how I don't remember how to do anything in this game anymore. Like I was, I was like, wait, what? Like <laughs> I figured it out pretty quick, actually. I did, but like I don't remember all the little like extra moves I had and how I used to use things. You know, I used to be really clean stuff up uh, in in these fights, and now I'm sorry. Like, wait, that all oh, right? I can do that. Like it was, it was a lot of relearning. Yeah. Um, and uh, and to be fair, like the Iki stuff, Iki Island uh, stuff, the Mongols on that island, like they're much harder than anything in the main game. Um, they've expanded, you know, how aggressive they are. Like the weapons they can use, they can swap out much faster. There are now shamans that like chant. Yeah, they buff. Yeah, they buff everyone, and so they get like yeah. more unblockable attacks and attack more often, and don't have as many like don't have as much delay between their attacks. Like you can get overwhelmed real fast if you're not careful and you don't take those shamans out first. Well, the other thing that I noticed pretty, which quickly, I appreciate because the game is too easy otherwise. Yeah, the other thing that I noticed really just briefly, the amount of time I played was that the. Uh, they force you to change your stances. So mm-hmm. in the base game, I hardly ever mess with the stances. Oh, I, I always need, use them. You do, but yeah. I didn't. I didn't need to. Like, I could make it you, through yeah, the you game. Yeah, can, you can hack your way through a spear guy with a sword stance if you have to. You yeah, know? and so I, I mess with it for fun at times. I didn't do it out of, like, necessity, and so I didn't explore that system all that much. But in this, it no, you appears you have it. to. No, you got to do it or you won't be able to get through their defense. Because the enemy's... They'll change the stance mm-hmm. that you have to use. Yep. Like they'll have a shield, then they'll put the shield away. Yeah. And that cha- then suddenly pull out the a second stance- sword, and suddenly you got to go. To yeah. Your swords. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah. That's that changes things up pretty. pretty no, it much. definitely it definitely makes the combat more interesting and more challenging, and uh, like that would be yeah you know that was kind of one of the things I was hoping for. Like I you know the the game I really felt like I had was the master of the world by the end of that the main game. Mm-hmm. Like you know no one could stand up to me. Yeah. In anything, and I still, ha- you know, I still have enough bonuses on things that, like, I can kill five guys in a standoff at the beginning of a fight. And, mm-hmm. But you know, there's fights you end up in that I'm just like, oh, these guys are just firing artillery at me. Like, there's, right. there's new ideas in here that, like, you're not prepared to deal with until you get a little further on and maybe learn some things. And there's like one new uh, skill, t- skill. It's not a tree; it's a line. But there's a new skill line of uh, the for the horse. The horse can charge now and knock enemies over and kill them. And like. That's actually, you know, at first I'm like, okay, that's, I guess that's something. To, but and then like a little bit further, I'm like, okay, that's I need to be doing that. Like, yeah. I'm not going to make it across this open ground to get to the fight if I don't use the horse charge to cross over and knock some guys, guys down so I'm not fighting 20 people yep. when I get there. And then the shaman chants and everybody gets super powered, and that's the, and that's the end. Yeah. Like, you know, but I like that. I, I, that's really cool. Like, you know, the, the, the fact that the expansion content acknowledges that I am – powered up and have all these abilities and, and really forces me to use them as good. It even warns you when you first go yeah. that like you're about to, you know, you're about to commit to a long series of quests with challenging things is going to demand like maximum ability from Jin and you, you need to be upgraded for this. Do you, are you sure you want to go? Mm-hmm. And, and I was, and I am, you know, I'm fully maxed out from the, from the game other than the new skills. And, uh, I'm, we should mention I'm, you only need to make it to chapter two yeah. of the base game to, yeah. But it really, it really feels like post story content. Yeah, like it really feels like something you should do at the end of the game, mm-hmm. um, both in terms of the challenge level and in terms of the narrative. Yeah. Um, Speaking of the narrative, mm-hmm. what is kind of the plot? So the plot is that, um, like, the way it, it presents itself at first is a mission pops up on the like the like the southeast coast of the first island. Um, I think it's a, I think it's the southeast coast, but it's a. Uh, Southwest, maybe um, it's down there somewhere, and you go and you find that every there's like people there's, there's been a massacre, and the people who are survivors are like kind of babbling, like they're they've lost their minds, and you find evidence that it was uh, something called the Eagle Clan, uh, which is something like, they haven't shown up before, um, and it turns out it's that a this, Mongols. It's right? a Mongol clan. It's a Mongol clan called the Eagle Clan, um, or the Eagle Tribe, and they are um, they have invaded Iki Island. Um, and Iki Island was the place it's off the southeast coast of Tsushima and it was the um, there was a fort there like a Sekai fort was there with, and that is where Jin's father was killed like it was a big I believe that's what they're, they're saying there was a big fight there between samurai and basically peasants who didn't want to be ruled by samurai and uh, in the end uh, the this the Jin's clan was forced off the island. Mm-hmm. So, 
uh, the people there are not fans of samurai. You know, they're not. They're they're very against the feudal system and the and the lord system. They're not into that. Uh, they kind of ruled themselves. Uh, they're considered raiders and outlaws by you know Jin's father and and such. Uh, but um, and that is why when you go, you actually you get an item that uh, dis- a version of your armor. If you want to use the, the the your own clan's armor, which does have some really nice bonuses, there's a color you get for it that hides the logo, that hides the clan symbols, mm. so they don't know who you are. Huh. Because if they know who you are, you are basically like Hitler to them. Like uh-huh. they, they are, you are the son of the guy who came and conducted massacres like 20 years ago. Right. Um, and Jin had a bad time there, and you know he, it was like some of his first battles, and like he had to kill basically peasants armed with rusty sword. You know, it was it was not the Samurai not, War not of, of and yeah, out. it was not the epic Samurai <laughs> War of glory and legend he was picturing. It was it was a dirty massacre that uh-huh. they did. And, you know, so nobody's too happy with things. No one's happy to see him as a samurai in general. Um, but the Mongols are a bigger threat, so you end up teaming up with basically uh, people who would consider you their mortal enemy to, to stop the Mongols. Stop the Mongols. Uh, now, and the, so the biggest surprise of this expansion for me so far is that I don't like it very much. I am shocked um, to hear you say which that. Which is, yeah, shocking shocked. to me, too, because this is one of my favorite, ga- one of my favorite games of the last year, one of my yeah. favorite games of the last several years. Yeah. Um, here's my main... And I love the combat. I like the new stuff with the new Mongol clan and all that. But here's my problem when you, the, with it so far, is that the one of the first things that happens is you're supposed to go take the fort. And when you do, spoilers, you don't take the fort. Like, they, you, you, it's a fight you can't win. Okay. And you get captured and the, and the eagle, the leader of the clan, who's like kind of a witch sort of character, uh, feeds Jin this, they call it poison, but it's like a hallucinogen. And it's basically a permanent thing and he hallucinates about like his father and when he was traumatized as a youth and like all weird. So basically it does the thing that so many games do where the protagonist gets drugged and then you have to play through these weird surreal things and flashbacks that talk about his deepest fears and deepest traumas and the theme of the game. And the, the, and you're just running through a non-interactive areas with like weird things flashing in and out of existence. Sounds like Far Cry. It is. I mean, part of this might just be I played so many Far Cry games I'm just sick of it you know it's just like because yeah. I hated that part those parts in Far Cry 5 uh-huh. um, right down to when Far Cry 5 would forcibly kidnap you and make you go through all that stuff right. and like I was uncomfortably reminded of that uh-huh. when they did this and the, and so now you're like you're running around and periodically the, the screen will go weird and Eagle will talk to you about it. it's like oh you, you're you going to be betrayed by the people it's like yeah shut up like one of the <laughs> things I liked about Tsushima was that it was more grounded. It was historically driven. It did not have weird stuff like that in it. Like that's it's it's not how hallucinations work. Like yeah. it's like you know there is no poison that can just make you go psychedelic for like the rest of your life. <laughs> life. Like that's not you know and and, uh. and I just it's just it's not what I want from this. It's and and like the rest of it's you know the fighting's cool. Like the story of like you know trying to figure out hiding who he is from the the raiders and and sort of like proving himself there. Like that's all cool. But so much of it is like this dumb like drug fueled like hallucination thing that's supposed to be about his like origins as a as a boy and becoming a samurai and his father's disappointment and I'm just like it's just it's just the most cliched stuff wow. you could do and I really don't like it so far. Huh. Um maybe I'm it gets, shocked maybe it gets better that. later but I'm I'm very disappointed by that aspect. The open world stuff awesome uh, it, it is not as big. The island is not remotely as big as the first island yeah. of, of um, but it is about the size of the first area. Um, before you break through the, to the up north part of the first island, mm-hmm. and it is denser, I would say, than than the first area of the of the main game. So there is a lot to do, and there's stuff that you can. There's further upgrades. There's new uh, things you can do. There's archery challenges you can do, which upgrade your your bullet time uh, aiming thing, and you do need to upgrade that for a charm you get for that to actually get the better ratings on the archery challenges. There's um, new flute stuff. There's like, you, you get to go to these like animal sanctuaries and release animals and, and you learn new flute songs from that. And actually um, the flute songs are interesting because first you have to wiggle the controller to like a, like a, like a sound wave thing comes sort of at you diagonally from the back of the screen and you have to like, move a cursor up and down through it to learn the song. Yeah, we just were showing some of that in the um, B-roll, actually. But the other cool thing about it is when you play fl- flute stuff, they the flute plays, and a little bit of the flute song comes out of the speaker and the controller, but the main way they convey the flute song to you is through the haptic feedback. Like, it actually vibrates in your hand to the 
pitch of the song the flute is playing and yeah. it's a really neat effect yeah the controller um, is really just boss yeah. the other thing of course <laughs> is a great um, controller the other thing of course is that you know it looks a little better um you know that game the game was always gorgeous uh it looks a little better runs a little better now especially if you put it in high frame rate mode um the japanese voiceover is lip synced yep. now uh, which is great i've switched to that completely now and it's it's it sounds good and it's fun. The only complaint I have there is they did not subtitle the incidental pedestrian chatter. Oh, really? So I don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> I mean, they're all just saying it. It's not anything important. Yeah. But, like, I, I like to know what the characters around me are saying. And a couple yeah. times, they've just, two guys have just been ch- chattering away. And I don't know what the hell they're talking about because they didn't subtitle it. Um, that's, the, that's the only complaint I would have about that. Um and you know, there's a bunch of new vanity, uh, you know, cosmetic items you can get, and like you, you know, new game plus. Uh, I started new game plus to see all that, and there's a lot of stuff to do there. You're you're no longer leveling him up. You're gathering uh, ghost flowers to pay for the cosmetic stuff. That's you know, so you're sort of walking through that, and it does up the difficulty. You get like whatever difficulty you played the previous game on, it, it goes up to that plus, and so it's a okay. little harder, which is noticeable but not a huge difference. Um, so it's fun to revisit that, but like I. You know, I played uh, Iki Island on my PS4 save that I imported because I obviously the New Game Plus was not far enough along to, to go there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but I after you know, so I played it so I could talk about it here. But I will probably just go back to my New Game Plus. No, really. After this, and get I'll get to Iki Island eventually. But like, it's not pulling me in in the way that wow. I was hoping. Wow, I'm would. really surprised to hear that. Also, been hearing that it's not very long. It doesn't seem like it would be. Yeah, like there's saying, a, It was almost like people were under the impression that it was going to be almost as long as the main game, maybe be a little shorter. Yeah, well, well that's but, the thing is like one, at one point they said it was going to be the same size as the first island. Yeah. And the thing is, I think people were taking that to mean the literal first island, right. which is a large, tall. Th- but restarting in New Game Plus, I was reminded that at the beginning of the game, you're only allowed to go in the southern half of that island right and you have to gather right. your you know yeah. you have to gather your your allies yep. and then you storm that castle and rescue your father yeah and then you get the access to the north part of the island and then after you finish that part you get that other other yep. part of the island above it yeah and so i think what they meant to say is it's the same size as that first area uh, okay. which is about right that from makes what i can sense. see Ge- yeah. geographically speaking it's about that same size yeah um, which is a lot. I mean, it's not nothing. It's like there's yeah, a lot yeah. of open world content. There's a lot of non-essential yeah, stuff. I think to that go took do. me six, seven hours, something like that. I'd say at least, yeah. yeah. Especially if you're doing everything, collecting everything, going everywhere, and the terrain is different. Like there's, you know, it's a little different to navigate. It looks different because it's more of a volcanic island. There's a bunch of stuff with that. Uh, Game's just gorgeous. Playing it on oh, PS5 beautiful. is like people always use the the phrase "oh, jaw dropping." Mm-hmm. This game made my jaw drop a, a couple times. I yeah. only played it for like twenty minutes, and I was like, "Holy crap!" Yeah, there's a I may, so like my my because I had was, not gone back and like played yeah. the base game on PS5. I had not done mm-hmm. that, so this was like my first time. Yeah, it's, like, it's a good jump. My, wow! My, 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 so my friend was watching me play, wow. and she is a big. She's very particular about graphics and art style, and you know, to her, nothing is ever going to beat Last of Us Two in mm-hmm. terms of. And you know, and she's when she crit- she criticized this one a bit, and she's right. The character models and animation are not as gorgeous they as the, stand as out the environments yeah. in this. Like, mm-hmm. and there's a couple things, even in some of the cutscenes in, in the Iki Island stuff. There's a couple bits where like someone rides up on a horse and gets off, and you're like, oh, like that, yeah. that's not. It, it's a it's a little janky in places like that. But the environments, the the natural world of this thing is, and the use of color is second to none. Oh, this this game definitely does not have the polish of Naughty Dog or Insomniac. No, games. but in terms of like art yeah. direction, it is a it's triumph incredible. like few yeah. few other games can yep. claim. I mean, it's still beautiful. Oh yeah, like, it's, like I am. Fi- I mean, considering it's an open world game and and you know what they have to use the characters for, I think they work just fine. Yeah. Um. But she did make a comment about how it's, it would have been interesting to see them stylize it a little more and like if this if it was if the art style and the, certainly the portrayal of the characters maybe a little more like halfway between like this and like okami yeah um that would have been an interesting way to, to take it um people I, have questions in chat mm-hmm. you may be able to answer them maybe not um sneaky asks is the game easy um i didn't play it very long but I didn't think the the battles that I was in were very easy. No, the the new Mongols, the Iki Island stuff is not easy. I would not say I, it's manageable, especially if you can remember how to play the game after a few minutes. But like, 
uh, it's gonna if so far at least it's made it's made me use all my ability. It, it, like it is not a thing where I can you know the normal game even in new game plus where I'm just like I'm just gonna stand here and everyone's gonna come at me and I'm gonna do perfect parries and slash the hell out of you and cut your arms off and that's gonna be the end of it. Yeah. Like, in I'll say this uh, you know my, the armor is giving me a bonus two uh, kills in the standoffs. And that has saved my life a few times. Huh. Like, these guys are tough. Not easy. And if, and if that shaman, show, shaman shows up and starts buffing them, and you don't know where that guy is, like, you're in, you can be you're in, in trouble. real trouble before you know it. Like, I've, I've actually run out of, uh, of resolve from healing in the middle of a battle, which I, has never, never happened, happened yeah. in the main game. Like, like it, it really feels like they took a hard look at how people were, like, getting through and, and handling it. Handling things in the main game, we're like, okay, we're going to design everything in this expansion. <laughs> we're going to design everything in this expansion to short circuit that. Yeah, and so it did, and it's great. Okay, um, Cinetike is asking, um, is it worth coming back to if you didn't play it the the base game for a really long time? I mean, I did. Yeah, and I am like, I don't. There's nothing else I'd rather play right now. I mean, I love that game anyway, but. Uh, I'm just going to I want to go through the game again basically and I you know starting up the new side quest with the various you know story arcs of the of the of the allies reminded me of how good those were like those you know, the main story I think is kind of a by the numbers kind of samurai honor versus like doing the right thing thing but all the side stories with the various characters that he recruits as his allies those are those are really awesome like a lot of those are really interesting in the b-roll you're just seeing the horse charge that Matt was talking yeah. about a little earlier there is a nice uh, like early on early. And we were, I think we're seeing it here actually. The quest to find um, the horse because mm-hmm. the horse gets lost in a shipwreck and you have to go find him again. And um, and it did remind me that like one of the things I actually like about Jin as a character is he is very kind to animals. Like he's like he loves animals. It's it's like a weird subtle thing that that is there that's clearly a part of his character. And his concern for the horse is really nice. Like it's it's like it's all he thinks about when you first get to the island is is what happened to the horse. Mm-hmm. So I like I actually like that. Yep. And it's your first encounter with some of these harder Mongol groups, and uh, it's nice that like once you get the horse back, it teaches you the horse charge, and you're like, oh, that's very essential. <laughs> like that takes out a bunch of guys before I have to fight them. Now the upgrade, if you already own it, is twenty on PS4 and thirty on PS5. Is yes. that right? Yeah. Okay. If you don't own the director's cut at all and, and the director's upgrading. cut how much standalone is it 60 70 yeah i want to say it's 70 on ps5 like any like any ps5 game really. okay um and if you have if you have for if for some reason you have the director's cut ps4 version it's ten dollars to upgrade to the ps5 version of the director's cut it's just getting so it's complicated. too complicated it is <laughs> it really and none is. of that went up until the day you know the, the upgrade stuff didn't go up until the day it came out and so if you, so when i went to yeah, you know, when I went to the the game page on my PlayStation Five, there was you know I had the download option, but then I had a little window in this on the side that had the twenty nine ninety nine upgrade that I could just buy there, and that would become my PS Five version. But there was nothing about it that said that, and so I kind of had to look up like the and I'm like, okay, well the thirty dollar version is supposed to be this, so I because I didn't want to buy the wrong thing. Because Sony will never give you your money back <laughs> for right. that, yep. so I'm like, okay, that must be it. Even though it didn't say upgrade, it was it was weirdly vague about it. But at the on the plus side, it downloaded the right thing on its own. I didn't have to do the weird switch between versions and accidentally install the PS4. Yeah, version get down thing. to the button. And, yeah, yeah. And when I loaded it up and wanted to like import my PS4 save, it just found my PS4 save and brought it in. I didn't have to do the Spider Man thing where you had to load up Spider Man PS4 version export export the save for then that then load up, up the, the ps5 version, version and import then. that and then <laughs> i mean part of that's because spider-man was made before they knew how that would work yeah, for sure um and you know now they were able to kind of probably able to put that in ghost of Tsushima ps4 already or at least update it at yep. some point so it was very simple but it was a it was a smooth experience once i figured out which thing i was supposed to buy yeah um again sony's store experience is not ideal has never been ideal and that's true here too but whatever worth I'll the ju- 20 or 30 yeah. bucks i think it is i mean yeah. i love this game a lot and playing it again looking like that with the better japanese voices lip sync uh is great um it's certainly that i would certainly call it the definitive version of the main game whether you like the iki island stuff or not if you are not as burned out on the hallucinations with a main character thing as i am then i you probably won't have the same issue with this story that i do i just 
I just don't. Yeah, there's lots of comments like in chat being like, I like the hallucination stuff from yeah. all games. I mean, then, then <laughs> you're going to like this a lot. Like, I, yeah. I'm just. I'm just tired of it. I don't find it imaginative it's a, anymore. It's a it's crutch. a crutch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, 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 but you got to remember, in this game, we're it, older, and right? We've seen these things well, a lot more well, times. Well, especially than a lot of in people. this game, it feels like like a cheap end run around the fact that the rest of the game is very grounded. Yeah. Um, and I like that about it. I like that it's not weird. That's what I liked about it, too. You're, you're not fighting I like that and... it didn't have a bunch of weird, like, supernatural yeah. crap in like, it. Like, I like that the closest that it gets is that the foxes you follow to the fox dens are a little smarter than the foxes should be. You know, like, right. I, yeah. Like, that kind of thing. I like that. Or the wind is in a character. Yeah, kind of yeah. Like, like, that stuff I like. But I don't want, like, Ninja Gaiden-style sort of magic and stuff in it. And yeah. the hallucination thing gets a little too close to that for my taste. And it sort of breaks... What I'm after. Also, I don't care about his daddy issues. I don't. <laughs> it's it's mm. like I like Jin as a character, but I, I'm more interested in his relationships with the various characters around him, not his weird past as you know, basically a spoiled brat who had to like learn what the world was actually like. I'm not saying that's a story that can't be told, but like I just don't Doesn't find resonate. it really interesting, and especially because he's such a stoic kind of like hard ass character in the present that you're like oh but he actually he was sort of a wuss back in the day <laughs> and I got I'm just not sure where they're taking that to like explain why how he became what he became or like if you're not supposed to see him the way I see him. I don't know like it I'm not really sure what the point is I guess I think it would be more interesting to me, to me I do like that Eagle is a very different you know big bad than the big ass you know cool well, you're also mo- teaming up boss. with him as well so hmm? aren't you also teaming up with the eagle against the Mongols. No. The eagle is the leader of the Mongols. Oh, okay, gotcha. The eagle is the Mongols' chief. She's she's like their witch. She's like a witch. And she's I thought like you a, said earlier that you were forced to team up with them. No, to you're, fight for, the you're forced to team up with the raiders, the the, pe- oh, the okay. peasants who fought you off back in the day. Oh, I thought that was the same group of people. No, okay. they're they're the they live on the island, but the Mongols gotcha. have invaded it. Okay, got you. And All so right. that's why they're willing to even entertain the idea of working with a samurai because. Basically, Jin tells them that like like you're know, like why would you want to help us when you tried to kill us 20 years ago? And yeah. he's basically like, well, if if they conquer you, they're going to come to Tsushima. So yeah, they're coming for if us. I stop them here, I'm protecting my home too. So they're and like, I need all right, help. I get. Also, like we got to do <laughs> something because the game's help. going. Um, also, I'm yeah, I've been poisoned by a magical drug, and I keep seeing demons everywhere. So I'm gonna probably need I'm probably gonna need someone to crash. You know, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, so there you go. That's Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut. Uh, 70 bucks if you buy it from the start. 30 to upgrade on PS5. 20 to upgrade on PS4. And Matt says, go for it. And 10 if you bought the if, PS4 Director's Cut and decide later to upgrade to the PS5. Yeah. I don't know why you would do if that. If you don't have a PS5 yet, uh, I would imagine what that would I guess. be. Uh, so anyway, there you go. Um, I did not play enough of it to really offer much of an opinion on it other than it's bloody gorgeous. And yeah. I did like the tweaks to combat. Um mm-hmm. So, so far, so good for me. I will we'll spend some more time with it, hopefully. We'll see how that goes. Um, but Q4 is a lurking, and I got Psychonauts 2 to plow through over the next week or so here. So we'll see how it goes. I'd like to return to it because I do really like the base game and have a feeling if I played more of this, I'd probably like it as well. Mm-hmm. So, okay. It's that time of the show. It's time for Name That Game. I already got the stickers out to last week's winner going... All the way overseas to Portugal. So we will send the stickers to you no matter where you live. For those of you who maybe have not seen this so far, it is a competition between all y'all and Matt Kyle. And basically how it works is I give you a series of clues and you need to name the game that I'm talking about. Um, I think I'm getting better at writing these. I have discovered though, Matt, that Certain games, it's either impossible or really hard mm-hmm. to write clues that like just don't give it away right away. Um, I think I did a good job this week. Last week's went really well. The first week's was terrible. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah, Cinetike, he won last week. He's in there saying, yeah, the stickers are on the way. And he's from Portugal. Um, so we'll send these anywhere. Um, just to reiterate, um, if Matt comes up with the name of the game and I look over at chat... And the name of the game pops up there in the next like second or two. I'll give it to you guys. You guys get the win. Um, Matt has to clearly beat you guys at this for him to win. Uh, we want to give you guys a little bit of help because Matt is like an encyclopedia of video game mm-hmm. knowledge. I don't think it would be fair otherwise. Plus, there's like a delay on the chat. So we err on the side of our crew, our sifters. So 
that's how it works. The first clue, the clues get more obvious as we go. The first one's very cryptic. And then with each clue, I try to be a little more obvious to make it easy. I want one of you guys to win. I'm not trying to fool like both of you guys. I also write the clues with the idea that I know you're sitting there using Google to figure it out. So hmm. it's 100% okay if you want to use Google. Just putting it out there. All right. Are you ready, Matt? Sure. Chat, are you ready? All right. I'm ready. I hope... I think I'm getting better at this. We'll see. Huh. And here is the first clue. Matt, you didn't you didn't cheat and look at the, the paper, did you? And I can't read that far anyway. Okay. Here's the first clue. Get, get ready on your keyboard. On. Sneaky, they can use Google if they want to. It's totally fine. Here's the first clue. This game was released on the eve of fall 2007. I don't expect anyone to get it from that. If you do, you're a genius. I'll read it one more time. Mm -hmm. The game was released on the eve of fall 2007. Anyone? Bueller. The eve of fall. Yep. Comes the ticking clock. Let's see. Portal, no. To Human, no. Assassin's Creed, no. Titanfall, no. Halo 3, no. Nox, Aeternitis, got it. Bioshock. Mm -hmm. Bioshock. <laughs> Eve. I knew Eve was part of it. Yeah. It, it's hard to anticipate what people are going to do. Because I'm guessing what people just did was biggest games of 2007, 2007 Eve. And, and just went down the list. And or 2007 Eve would have Maybe it's just yeah. impossible to do this. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, if, you, if, you, if well. you allow Google, yes. Yeah. But, but I mean, I can't, can't stop, stop I can't that. keep them from using Google. Yeah. Crap. Okay. Well, you won, Knox. Um, send me <laughs> send me your uh, your shipping info. It doesn't matter where you live, and we'll ship the stickers out to you. I will read the rest of the clues. Just I mean, it was right there in my. I, if I he's give the me, only one that got it though. Yeah, but if you given me a little bit longer, well, no, I guess Norix ended up getting it a little later. Yeah, man, I I don't I mean, know how e you can write these without giving it away. Yeah, I mean, well, you got to give it something. Yeah, you might. One thing you might want to do is not name the year until later in the clues. So here's a second clue. It's plain to see that this game could take place on Hydra Island. Hmm. Do you get that clue? Um, Hydra Island? No. Anyone in chat get it? Oh, Knox says he didn't use Google, if that matters. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think anyone gets that clue either. So it's plain... Plane I got with a plane crash. To see that this game could take place on Hydra Island. Hydra Island is the island from Lost, the mm. TV show. I really worked on these, all for nothing. Um, the third clue, an atlas won't help you get to this game's location. Hmm? Atlas. Mm. An atlas won't help you get to oh, this right. game's location. I worked on these, all for <laughs> nothing. Uh, the next clue, after you play this game, you will definitely know Jack. Ah, uh, yes. This is where they start to get a little more obvious. Uh, the next clue, at the time, at the time, it was a real shock to the system for the first-person shooter genre. System shock, obviously. And then the last clue, if you guys didn't get it from the one before, which you should have, would you kindly take a guess at this game's name? Right. Yep. Um, I think part of the key is you need to save the year until a later clue. Maybe. That might help. Because that opens up Google, basically. Right. It makes it more likely that they'll find something. Yeah, the, on the year makes it much more Googleable. Yep. Uh, well, here's your round of applause for your victory. Excellent work. He says he didn't use uh, Google. I kind of believe him. I more I believe him. Like, <laughs> like I knew it was Eve. Like Eve. I'm like, okay, the key there is Eve, and I just couldn't place it because because what when you said Eve of Fall, I kept thinking Fallout, but I knew that was 2006. So, yeah, and I just couldn't switch over to 2007. It's hard. It's hard to put these questions together for this. Um, I'm doing the best I can, guys. Hopefully I'll keep getting better. I thought last week was better than this week. At least you got to like to the fourth clue last week before yeah. someone got it. Getting well, Van it on the first clue, uh, that's an Vanguard epic failure. A, Vanquish is also a much more obscure game. It is. Yeah. I figured Bioshock's so old, though. Everybody um, knows Bioshock. Yeah. 
Well, people are giving me golf claps for the clues. I'll take it, guys. All right. Fair enough. Uh, well, that game ended so quickly that we have some more time for Q&A than normal. Uh, so get your questions into the chat. Go at Sifted Games so it's easy for us to pluck them out from all the other discussion in there. Um, let's see what you guys got. Go to full screen first. Bring up the chat on screen. Um, Cinetype, don't stop doing this. It's fun. I remember last week people typing all sorts of guesses. Yeah. If I do it right, it's fun. If I do it wrong, it ends very quickly and very badly. Mm. <laughs> uh, Yakov226, why don't we see anything from Sony? They have nothing to show, or we will we be surprised at Gamescom? You will not be surprised at Gamescom. No. They, have, they have nothing to show right now. <laughs> I mean, they really don't just don't have anything to show. Um, Horizon Forbidden West being delayed out of Q4 is a nightmare. It really is. Um, it leaves a huge hole from Ratchet mm-hmm. until like Q1 of next year. Um, it's bad. Certainly, the, the in terms of like really high profile stuff, that's I'm, it. I don't know if it's bad enough to turn the tide of the console war. Or it's whatever. not, especially since pe- a lot of people are not sitting around with a PS5 and nothing to do. They're still trying to get a PS5. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, and they still have, you know Call of Duty is still going to clean up on that platform. You know, there's a bunch of other stuff to play. Like you said, Dying Light Two yep. probably going to make it for December. Yep. Um, there's plenty to play. It's just stuff that's also available for other systems. But it feels like for for right now, most people seem to pick one or the other for next gen. Right now, I'm sure yep. people will catch up with the other system later on. But uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal um, unless you're talking directly about Sony's bottom line in terms of revenue. They're definitely going to lose a lot of Christmas revenue from not having Horizon. But they'll make it up in Q1. It'll be it'll be okay. It's just kind of disappointing that we don't get a a game that I was really looking forward to, and um, you know. The the Sony first party quality is is a hard drug to kick. You know, it's yeah. it's, it's 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 not. You know, like I'm I'm interested in a bunch of games in the fall, but I'd be more interested in, in a Horizon or a you know, Rare Air. Yeah, I mean, most studios just don't make games that polished and yeah. that good. So it is what it is. Uh, don't forget to send me your mailing address. You can send it. You can DM us here on Twitch. You can DM me on Twitter at Dinfire. You can DM me on Sifted at Shane. Anywhere you can get at me, just send me your mailing address, and uh, I will honestly send out your stickers tomorrow. Um, I have a little routine going now. I get the address, and then I make sure I send them out the next day. So make sure you get that to us, and we'll get them out to you. Uh, Let's see. Derek D111, Michael Pachter's favorite sifter. If I had to pick one person, I think you're it, man. Um, he thinks you ask great questions, and you do. JM Rain, thank you for the subs, man. That's awesome. Um, will Activision be brave enough to put the Blizzard name um, on Diablo 2 Resurrected? That's an excellent question. That's a really good question. I think that'll be the big litmus test, won't yeah. it? Yeah. I think that's where we're going to figure out if your hypothesis is true and that they're going to ditch the Blizzard name. Mm-hmm. If you do not put Blizzard on Diablo 2, I think you'd be right. It's not coming yeah, back. If you just have, have a big, uh, who made that? Was that Vicarious? The the resurrected because it wasn't Blizzard. It was they. Oh yeah, that there's out. some. Is that Vicarious other, Visions or I something think like that? So yeah, some other studios working on it. Yeah, if it's just their logo up front, maybe get a little Blizzard thing in the bottom somewhere in the copyright info. Like yeah, it's I don't dicey. know. I don't know what they're gonna do. I don't know that like, I would blame them. I would. I would do that. I would take. I would take the, all, as many Blizzard logos off that thing as I could. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, thanks for the question, Derek. What's the point, and this is from Vincent, what's the point of hyping up big betas with a wide audience and locking it behind NDAs? Either it leaks, like Battlefield 2042, or the game gets forgotten, like Riders Republic. Um, I mean, I think there might be a little part of it that they're hoping people leak stuff. Yeah, there's, there might be a little bit of like, oh, forbidden knowledge thing. Yeah. But it's, it's a, yeah, I don't know what the point is. I mean, you know that that's not going to stay quiet. Yeah, I think the publishers are struggling with the YouTube age. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that some of them still kind of live in this this place from like five or six years ago where you could tell somebody not to do something and they wouldn't do it. And I think even at first, a lot of YouTubers were, they looked at how things were done by traditional media outlets, like the ones that I've worked at and you've worked at in the past, and I think they felt like they needed to adhere to that at first to get access 
They're like, oh, this is the game. These are the rules of the game. And I need to play by the rules to get the access. I think once they got the access, it started this slow transformation of them being like, wait a minute, we have all the power. Because Mm -hmm. if I break this embargo, everyone else is going to break it. And they're going to cut me off. Are they going to cut all the influencers off? I think there's both sides have struggled to find kind of this middle ground um, between the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things. And I think honestly, what's just happened recently is that the influencer are like, you know what? F you like, you're not going to cut away my access because I have 8 million followers on my YouTube page or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the power has shifted so drastically towards influencers that, I mean, it's absurd. You, some of the videos these people put out are just trash. And they'll do like 3 million views. It's like how, if you're a publisher, how do you cut that person off? You can't. Mm-hmm. You just can't. So I think they figured out they have the leverage. And I think the publishers at this point are like, you know what? We'll put the rule out there for the people who actually have a little bit of honor and will honor it. But knowing that ultimately it's going to be broken and hopefully the damage isn't too minimal. And hopefully the influencer who covers it likes it Mm -hmm. and doesn't trash it and doesn't do like what some people did to like Mass Effect Andromeda, where they just grabbed like the bad clips and made montages of the bad clips and basically doomed the game. Um, So it's just we're living in a new frontier at this point. And I think both sides are kind of struggling to figure out how it's going to work. The relationship is going to work. That's what I think anyway. Um, Let's see. Uh, One Supermaster Gamer. Matt already talked about the Spider-Man trailer, but maybe you want to give another recap, Matt, of of what your impressions Um, were. Yeah, I mean, I think it looks good. I'm definitely going to see it. Uh, My problem with it is that it's, you know, the Spider-Man movie trailers are done by Sony Pictures, not Marvel Studios. And um, Sony Pictures' marketing tactic for the last 25 years has basically been to show you the whole story in the trailer. It's basically coming to theaters near you of the following plot. And the new teaser, which I think was supposed to be some kind of... I think that was mostly supposed to be shown to just like distributors or something. I don't know if that was originally supposed to be released because that's a three minute long that's teaser. A that's long a long teaser trailer. But it's basically near as I can tell, it's basically the first third or one half of the movie. Yeah, and like it blows a couple of reveals. There's a couple of reveals like look the reveals that some of the, uh, the old villains are coming back from the old mo- the previous Spider Man movies. That was mostly leaked partly by Alfred Molina himself, but like. Not everyone's going to follow the, that kind of news. It's not you don't have to like blow that surprise for everybody. At least not mm-hmm. this early. Um, the whole ba- background thing on like what happens with Strange and like the multiverse stuff is like it's it's just you know it's it's all a little. Bleh. It's just like it's like it's like, a, it's like you're sort of, I, it's like I compare it to Shang Chi where it's like um, you know you Shang Chi shows a lot like you you feel like you've seen got a good handle on the movie but people who've seen Shang Chi say that like you haven't seen anything like, like you've mm-hmm. barely seen anything from the first third of the film. Like, like there's tons of stuff in the movie you have no idea about. And there's some stuff in Spider-Man obviously know about, know about, but we've got like four trailers left guys. Like, you know, this is the company that showed the last shot of the previous Spider-Man movie in the trailers. Yeah, that's true. Like <laughs> that's crazy, dude. Yeah. Like it's, I just don't get it. Like it's, 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 it's not like these movies don't have enough in them to cut like a, like a, like an artful sort of, teaser thing with it that doesn't like it gives you the tone it gives you the flavor but doesn't give you the narrative and they just don't every other marvel movie does like you know like i don't really know what the eternals is about even after that last trailer that came out even i know there's a celestial in it but like like i can't really tell you what's going to happen in that movie but if you ask me what's going to happen in spider-man no way home i can pretty much tell you the whole setup like it's yeah it's bizarre and so like then you i sit in the theater and i'm sort of like it's not like I don't enjoy it, but I'm sort of waiting for like the part I already know about to be over so I can see then, you know, I don't care about spoilers really, but it's just like there's no verve to how they present that information to me. It's, yeah. I, I hate it. I really hate it. And I wish Disney would just throw $5 billion at Sony and take Spider-Man back. <laughs> um, it's worth the money. In the end, probably, but it they're about be. to have to pay that much for Hulu. So I think they're I think they've got their fingers in enough pies as it is. Um, Hulu's worth that. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I do think I I have a sneaking feeling, a fear that they're going to try to use the Spider Man movie. You have a sneaky sneaky feeling, feeling to, <laughs> that they're going to use the Spider Man movie to canonize the s- stupid spin off villain movies they're making, like uh. Ven- Venom and Morbius <clears throat> and uh, whatever else they're going to do. Um, First Venom movie wasn't terrible. I think it is terrible. I think it's fun. Like I thought it was fun, but a ba- it was a I bad it movie. On a it was flight. fun. 
Um, and that changes which is, which is a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I like <laughs> I the I like the surfing penguin does. movie on a plane. Like anything's good on a plane. It's better than staring out the window. Yeah, yeah. but like Venom, I like. I'm a big. I used to be Venom. Used to be my favorite character when I was growing up because uh-huh. I was a stupid kid. But like, I love I love Venom. Like the early Venom stuff is really good and it would be really good. But it's like Venom with no Spider Man attached to him is like it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And. You know, I and I like the. I think it's Venom's a bad movie, but I enjoyed it. You know, I, I like this. You know, it's my. It's, it's kind of fun trash. I do also enjoy that Tom Hardy seems to be the only one who knows he's in a bad movie. Everyone else is sort of sort of hamming it up, and Tom Hardy's trying to take it really seriously. And that kind of makes it work a, little yeah. weird, a weird way. I don't know what to think about the new one, the sequel. Like whenever the hell that comes out, I got the light again. Um, like it's like. Woody Harrelson is Carnage is kind of inspired casting, but I just don't think that. And like the less said about Morbius, the better. Um, I keep forgetting that movie exists because I try to block Jared Leto out whenever <laughs> I can. Um, and then they want to make like a Madam Web movie, and I guess like Spike Lee's making a Night Watch movie, which is like one of the most obscure That's characters strange. I could ever like. That was like a weird Spawn ripoff they put in the yeah, Spider Man books for a while yeah, in the nineties, and like. Yeah. Okay, sure. People liked that character, though. A little bit. It just didn't last very long. Yeah. Like, uh, while you're at it, why don't you make a Sleepwalker movie and a slapstick movie and a Dark Hawk <laughs> movie? Like, like, why don't we just do the whole mid '90s edgy? We're gonna do weird. I mean, they stuff put Polka thing. Dot Man in a movie, so all bets sure, are off. Sure. I mean, I'm I'm 100 percent waiting for Stilt Man to show up in one of these things, like. <laughs> Okay. Or paste pot Pete. Uh, we got to wrap it up here. Oh, there's so many questions in here. I'm sorry, guys. I can't get to all of them. Oh, there's so many. Um, J.M. Rain, thank you for all the subs that you're gifting to people. And everyone who he just gave us up, you should thank him. Um, aren't you supposed to be in school, dude? Yeah. Did, didn't you just start back to work today? Seems like you shouldn't be in here, but I'm glad you are, man. Thank you for uh, gifting all the subs to our people in chat. Um... So OCD Master, watch the archive of the show. We answer your question about if, for, since for Horizon's been delayed, mm-hmm. which console's having the better year. We actually tackle that um, throughout the course of the show. Um, I don't know if you're a patron or not, but if you're just watching the show on YouTube or on Twitch, um, you have to wait till the archive goes up on YouTube in about five days. Um, and I want to thank all the Twitch Prime people who jumped in at the end. Glottis21, thank you for Twitch Prime. Gohan Rage, thank you for Twitch Prime. Hope you're doing well, man. Um, Snark, thank you for Twitch Prime. <laughs> um, is that it? I know some people did it at the beginning, too, and I rushed the open. I did a terrible job with the open today. But I wanted to get into the show because I knew it was going to be a, a big show, um, and now it's too late for me to go back. So if you gave us Twitch Prime at the beginning of the show, thank you very much. Um, if you're listening or watching Game Face for free anywhere, um, whether it's on all the podcast services the show is on or whether it's on YouTube. We'd really appreciate it if at the very least you could hook us up with Twitch Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, it costs you nothing. It's free. All you have to do is link your Amazon account with your Twitch account, um, and you can give us a free $2.50 every month. Just go to twitch.tv slash games and scroll down. There's a little button that you can click. Free, $2.50 a month. Again, for people who can't afford to help us, I hope that you can afford to contribute, and if you can, Please go to patreon.com slash sifted. That's sifted without the E, S-I-F-T-D. You can pledge a dollar a month. You can pledge, someone just pledged $500 a month last week. You can pledge as much or as little as you want, and there are different rewards and tiers. You know how Patreon works. Uh, But we need your help. Um, We're not some gigantic Patreon that just has money coming out our ass that we can just blow on stupid crap like I see a lot of Patreons doing. Every dollar that we get goes into production. It goes into Matt's Pocket or it goes into Vincent's pocket, or it goes into my pocket. Uh, we're not blowing money around here. We need it to keep operating. Uh, so we appreciate every dollar. If you could head on over to patreon.com sifted and hook us up, it would be sweet. Uh, final reminder that next week's Game Face is not on Tuesday. It is on Wednesday. I have a doctor's appointment on Tuesday that I cannot miss. I waited months to finally get this appointment, and I finally got it. Um, and so please... Uh, remember that we're coming back 1, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern next Wednesday at twitch.tv slash games. And then the week after that, I'm like completely out. There won't even be a show the week after that. So make sure you tune in on Wednesday if you want to get your fix because we're not we're going to be away for a couple weeks after that. 
Um, and stay tuned to Twitter. I'm D- at Denfire. Matt is at M Kyle, M K E I L. And Sifted is at Sifted Games. And so if you're wondering when the show is going to come back after my little vacation, uh, make sure you're following us there and you'll get all the info. So there you go. That's it for Game Phase 269. Hope you guys have a great week. There's plenty of amazing games to play. Go out there and do it. Game Phase is up and out. (laughs) 